Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, welcome back to day two of our Cannabis in the Law uh, event. Um, uh, light crowd today, hello. <laughs> um, I want to thank you all for being here again today, and if this is the first time joining us, thank you for being here. Um, we had a really phenomenal day yesterday, some really great panelists, and we're excited to continue it today. Um, this morning, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, nationwide regulations, what those look like, what they should look like, so I'm gonna go ahead and invite uh, Benjamin Verratti, Professor Benjamin Verratti to the, the stage to introduce the panel and he will be moderating today, thank you. I stand up to lecture all day, every day. I'm going to sit down for a second. Let me make sure. We got enough. And these are all on. Yeah, that's right. nice. That's novel for me. I like that. <laughs> um, hi, everybody. Um, welcome. Welcome back. Um, welcome to what I will go ahead and assume are the 100,000 of you who are watching online. Um, it is. Uh, really good to be here. And also, um, let's take a, a minute to acknowledge these incredible students who have put together yeah. an amazing event. Really. Um, thank, thanks to all of you. And, and I know I've learned a lot um, just in the last day uh, in my area of specialty. So I, I know many of you must be feeling the same way. Um, today, our, our panel is titled Differences Between States Comparing State Regulation. Um, my name, as mentioned, is Ben Varadi. I'm a business and agriculture law professor here at VLGS. Uh, I also teach our summer cannabis law class, which I am happy to confirm has been added to our ongoing curriculum. Uh, I'm also a member of the board of the Oregon State Agriculture Law Bar Section, a member of the Oregon Cannabis and Psychedelics Bar Association. That's a recent renaming. Um, and before becoming a full-time academic, I was a cannabis law attorney and uh, a state licensed medical cannabis grower in Massachusetts and Oregon. Um, today, we're tasked with addressing state legislation. Uh, according to our program description, the recent DEA opinion on Delta 8, maybe we'll chat about that a little bit, um, and notably pro providing potential learning opportunities to states that haven't yet legalized. And I think that that is perhaps uh, the most interesting framework in that we can talk about some of the lessons uh, that have been learned thus far. Uh, the, the U.S. Supreme Court opinion in New State Ice Co. v. Lehman is remembered by most for a single line from its dissent, which is very familiar uh, to cannabis law practitioners, although it's not a cannabis case. It's, uh, Justice Brandeis said, a single courageous state may, if its citizens choose, serve as a laboratory and try novel social and, ex and economic experiments without risk to the rest of the country. That idea of states as laboratories of democracy uh, is, is a hugely important one, particularly as not just a, a majority of our states, but a substantial majority have demonstrated that courage and embarked upon what I think is the single largest concurrent series of laboratory experiments that we've ever embarked upon as a nation. And given that, I, I tried to work in some joke about how we were gonna go state by state and just start with Alaska and run through the list. Couldn't figure it out, but you know, because we can't highlight all of the different approaches and perspectives that are embodied within the law of these 37 states and three territories and the District of Columbia that have now legalized or substantially decriminalized cannabis to some extent. But what we can do is highlight how prohibition can best be ended, how we can bring equity and fairness to the forefront of our regulatory models and what best practices we've identified so far. Uh, towards that end, we are joined today by three truly outstanding leaders working in different spheres, all of whom spend much of their time thinking about these questions. Um, next to me is uh, Jason Ortiz, Executive Director of Students for a Sensible Drug Policy. Uh, we've got Matthew Byrong, Vermont Representative for District Addison Three, and Timothy Egan, former New Hampshire Representative and Instructor of Cannabis Business at Castleton University. Um, I am going to let these folks introduce themselves and share uh, some initial thoughts, and then our plan is really just to have a casual conversation. Our audience is absolutely welcome and encouraged to pose their own questions in that time, and, and we're just going to see how things go. Uh, so with that, uh, Jason? 
Sure. <clears throat> right on. And I don't know if we're able to get the PowerPoint up there, but I'll just start with my personal introduction. So hello, everybody. My name is Jason Ortiz. I'm the Executive Director of Students for Sensible Drug Policy. We are a 501c3 and c4 student-led organization that is international, although I'm the Executive Director of the US branch. And so we have over 80 student chapters across the country. We cover all drugs, and so all the different policies related to psychedelics, more stigmatized drug use, cannabis, and everything that we'll come up with between now and the time we finish this program, because there's always new drugs being created every day. Uh, but I was somebody who was arrested for cannabis possession as a high school student, and so I was 16. Uh, I'm originally from the state of Connecticut, and I was arrested in the state of Connecticut. I was thrown out of school and thrown into the criminal justice system, was luckily able to avoid incarceration, but only after my family paid tens of thousands of dollars in court fees and legal fees to barely make it through. And so as a middle class, double union working household, right? That amount of money, especially in early 2000s, was a significant amount of money for us. And so that was my introduction into drug policy. The first time somebody puts chains on you as a child really changes how you look at the law. And that was what made me an activist. Luckily, during that time, the internet was already out. I'm not that old, you know, but uh, we were able to look up, I was able to spend that time off researching things like the war on drugs. And so in that time, I learned a few phrases that would stick with me for a very long time. The war on drugs, the school to prison pipeline, and my favorite, selective enforcement. When I learned about the term selective enforcement, that definitely, again, radically changed how I looked at the law. So luckily, though, because of activists like folks in this room, SSDP that came before me, we changed the Higher Education Act's Federal Aid Elimination Penalty. That was the law that would deny you access to financial aid if you had an arrest or a conviction. But because activists changed that before I applied to the University of Connecticut, I was able to go to college. In college is where I found SSDP as a chapter member. We were doing research on timelines and I realized that SSDP made it possible for me to go to college and find SSDP. Now I'm the executive director of Students for Sensible Drug Policy, so I've definitely come full circle as far as getting arrested and then becoming an activist, and now I share that experience with folks across the country and train young people on how to change laws, how to write laws, how to organize events, how to lead meetings, all of those different details. But more recently, as an activist, I was also the president of the Minority Cannabis Business Association, MCBA. And so in that role, we drafted equity policies specifically. And equity to me means making sure that those who are most impacted by the war on drugs are able to benefit from the legal cannabis industry. Now, there's lots of debate around how that actually gets put into policy, um, but we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, we can move forward. Just a bit more about what we do. Uh, we're you know, a central grassroots organization. We do a lot of peer-to-peer -peer education. So we train young people on responsible drug use and train them to then train other young folks on responsible drug use. But we don't come from a prohibitionist or abstinence-only standpoint. We are more of a harm reduction perspective and making sure folks that are going to use drugs do so safely. Next slide. So Connecticut, uh, you know, I'm from Connecticut. I have a lot of strong feelings about it, but I was still the president of MCBA in 2021 when the legalization fight was happening in Connecticut. And in that battle, I served on Governor Lamont's task force on cannabis licensing and a lot of different aspects of cannabis legalization and actually introduced a competing bill, HB 6377, that was more focused on equity and actual labor concerns was a big part of that. It was introduced with State Representative Robin Porter, who was the chair of the Labor Committee. So strategically, having my version of the bill get introduced by the chair of the Labor Committee meant it was going to get out of the Labor Committee and could get to the full floor for a vote. And so we actually passed our version out of committee way before the governor was able to pass his through the judiciary and kind of set the conversation a bit in, in our favor, right? Because we were the first ones to define a lot of terms. And of course, the governor was not particularly happy with that. Uh, but at the end, we did a lot of organizing and we were able to make sure that we had certain elements that were really important to us something of a social equity program, making sure that students had their penalties and different types of programs addressed, and making sure that the Native American tribes that are in Connecticut were included in the process, and making sure that things like simple possession were actually decriminalized, and there were lots of different versions of how that could go. There was actually a time where the decriminalization would only affect if you had cannabis 
in a container that you purchased from a legal entity, right? So if you just had cannabis on you that was in a joint or in a bag, right, then that wouldn't be decriminalized. So we actually had to fight about that quite a bit. One of the other big fights that we had was over home grow. That was probably the most nasty and personal fight in the entire process, which was wild to me the entire time of whether or not home grow should be included. What ended up happening was, Patients got home grow immediately. Everybody else will have home grow on July 1st of this year. Um, but there was a time where folks said, if you keep fighting for home grow, you're gonna kill legalization. And that was the narrative for most of the legislative session. Now, of course, the bill passed with home grow in it. So that was always false. Um, but we were able to get a significant number of what we did want to uh, make sure was included. Oh, and of course, including making sure we had a community investment fund. So next slide. Now, this is where it gets real weird. Uh, so I was happy that I got a lot of the things I originally asked for in the final legislation. However, they introduced all kinds of wild stuff that I hadn't even considered as something that I needed to fight against. And so for how we defined equity, it's if you lived within a particular geographic region, either the first nine or nine of your first 18 years or five of the last 10 years, and the way they determined that map was rather complicated. It had to do with unemployment rates, arrest rates, and poverty rates combined. They actually changed it recently, but that was a geographic location. You had to make no more than three times the median income, so it was roughly $220,000. So you had to make less than that in order to qualify as a social equity applicant. It did not include whether or not you had a criminal history related to cannabis. This was something that I fought for the entire time and lost this fight, that we should include those with criminal histories related to cannabis as part of the equity programs. And to me, that was the central point of the equity programs, making sure those who are most impacted by the war on drugs are able to benefit from the legal cannabis industry. To me, the folks most impacted were the folks incarcerated for cannabis crimes. And so, we fought for that a lot. Actually, Senator Gary Winfield did introduce it for us, and the governor threatened to veto the entire legalization bill if it included those with criminal histories. Now, there are lots of reasons I think this happened, but I also think as law students, this is in part so that in the future they could reject the equity programs based on constitutional concerns. And that was something that I thought was really nefarious, that we're creating an equity program that is likely to fail constitutional concerns, right, constitutional tests. And so we'll talk a little bit about the New York lawsuit that just got introduced recently that's gonna be going at a lot of those pieces. But there was a couple other programs I hadn't even considered. So section 149 of our bill created an equity license. <laughs> I, I had, laugh even just saying it, right? It created an equity license for an unlimited size cultivation facility that had a licensing fee of $3 million. $3 million for an equity-centric license, right? And so you had to meet the qualifications of less than $220,000 a year, you had to live in an impoverished area, and also be able to pay a $3 million fee. And so this was one of those programs that we said, like, should we kill legalization over this? Like, 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 what is this, right? And so this was just a very bizarre program, did not fit what I thought of as an equity program, and it got introduced by you know some folks at the last minute. Our 400-page bill was only released 48 hours before the first vote on that bill with all these wild things in there. The other thing that was created was called an equity joint venture. An equity joint venture is a business that is half owned by a social equity applicant and an existing operator. So if you were in the medical industry, you could partner with a social equity applicant and you could create this equity joint venture. The equity joint venture would reduce the fees for the existing operator in half. And so to convert over, you had to pay a million dollars for a retail license and $3 million for a cultivation license. However, if you joined with an equity joint venture, you only had to pay $500,000 for retail and $1.5 million for cultivation. So that meant you were saving the existing operator millions of dollars by creating this business. So it seems good, oh great, that person will have support. However, there is no guarantees for the equity operator that their partner will be a good partner. Right? If that person enters in this agreement, they get the $1.5 million savings immediately, and what if they go out of business, or they just don't have the ability to support the operator, or never had real interest in supporting them at all? So I saw both of these situations as bizarre, unnecessary, and really kind of flying in the face of what we were all trying to do, 
and in a bigger problem, both of those are considered equity licenses. So when we say at a federal level or a state level, whether or not there'll be support for equity businesses, whether these ones are included is gonna be a big deal because if we're saying that there's a social equity fund to support folks that are in equity businesses, Curalief or GTI or any big MSO can access the funds to support their, their operations in the community equity fund. So this was a lot of fascinating approaches to licensing that we got very much at the last minute and it created a real conflict of you know what do any of these things mean what are we trying to do here who's going to be able to benefit from this so i want to point to those two because on the flip side if we're able to create these kinds of wild and ridiculous licenses that means us as citizens can also create our own wild and ridiculous licenses that benefit the people and communities that we care about. And that says, I'm not a lawyer, I've never been to law school, but one thing I do like about law is you can create all kinds of things in programs and law that you never thought possible, right? And they proved it. Uh, and so that is definitely something that we've been trying to build on and create new programs. Um, <clears throat> The one, uh, the few other pieces, uh, the license process and lottery process. So in addition to those spaces, we have a more basic lottery process where there are a number of licenses available. The number of licenses available have to be equal for social equity applicants and regular applicants. Now, we didn't think to set a minimum number of licenses that we should have because what happened was they came out and said six retail for the state on social equity, six retail for the state on general applicants, and so that's 12 retail for the entire state. However, equity joint ventures were unlimited, and that was a regulatory decision. So that meant if you were able to create 100 equity joint ventures as a major operator, as Curaleaf, you now had the power to create licenses as an MSO, as an operator. That is wild that we would give that power to existing operators to actually create more licenses and then severely restrict the amount of licenses available in the lottery. There are only two micro cultivation licenses available for social equity and two for the general population. So four micro cultivation for the whole state. But again, the other folks could make 100 if they wanted. The other problem with our lottery is you could buy more than one lottery ticket. So guess what folks did? They bought 5,000 lottery tickets and they were $150 to $500 a piece, but if you were able to put $10,000, $20,000 into the lottery process, you were able to just kind of wash out everybody else and you, that's exactly what happened. And so if you were a single operator just wanted to put in one lottery ticket, you were not getting a license. There was one round of lottery applicants, those have been awarded, and now we have no idea if and when there'll be a second round. So this has created this monstrosity of like actually being able to get into the industry, but if you are not part of that already loaded process, you have no legal pathway to get a license at this time. And so it has definitely created a lot of problems uh, and really, you know, a lot of different questions of how to unravel that difficult situation. Um, next slide. So this is actually section 149, so folks can see it. We'll be able to play it back again, but it lists literally the words $3 million in the fee, and that is definitely just, I didn't even know what to do with that at the time. Uh, next slide. So one good thing is that the student policies we did want introduced were introduced. Students who are under the age of 18 will not be arrested for cannabis possession at all ever again. And so for a personal level, what I got in trouble for will not happen again. And every school had to rewrite their policies to make them equal with alcohol at minimum. And so this is something I want to make sure we included that we did instruct the Department of Education to change their policies, not we'll talk about it later and then make them do it later. It had to be part of the original bill. Next slide. So I just want to briefly touch on this one from New York, the card lawsuit that is coming out for our law students in the room. Uh, many of the major operators are challenging the idea of a card license, which was a license that was created by the regulators uh, in order to better advance equity goals of the OCM, the Office of Cannabis Management. And this is, you know, about a week ago, they launched this lawsuit saying that in the law, it said all of the licenses should be awarded at the same time. And by creating a separate license and separate process, the entire process has been illegitimate. 
There have already been 50, I think 60 licenses awarded. A handful are open, but this could upend the entire New York program. It also challenges residency requirements and gets into issues with the Dormant Commerce Clause. And that is gonna have a huge impact. Uh, I am one that believes that interstate commerce is already legal and it will be happening faster than we think as far as what will be allowable or not, um, and we'll, we'll see. This lawsuit is going to make it very clear. We're gonna find out one way or the other how this is gonna go, whether residency requirements are legal or not, and to point back to the Connecticut situation, by removing the other types of qualifiers for the program and leaving it almost exclusively geographic and residency-based, it is highly likely that our equity program will not be able to stand up to this challenge. And so if there were other ways for folks to qualify, the program could have stood better uh, and been able to continue. So this lawsuit, I think, is definitely one that I encourage all law students to check out. It's ongoing. It just happened. And I think you know there will be ramifications of this lawsuit for generations to come. So thank you all so much for your time. I appreciate you know being able to be here and speak with these esteemed panelists. And if anybody is interested in starting a chapter of Students for Sensible Drug Policy, you can go to ssdp.org backslash chapters. We're happy to bring more law students into our fold and do great work here in the state of Vermont. So thank you. Thank you, Jason. <clears throat> um, that was... Uh, Really fantastic and, and informative, and, and I do want to emphasize that while Connecticut is particularly egregious, many <laughs> of, yes. of these issues um, are happening with social equity programs, uh, and th there is often a pattern of uh, sort of well-intentioned legislators uh, seeking to introduce social equity um, op opportunities to, to really um, confront some of the harm that's been historically caused by prohibition, and then finding themselves, I think, um, uh, within the, the more general lawmaking pro process, which can involve uh, substantial trade-offs at, at times to the point where the legislation ultimately uh, is a little bit un unrecognizable to its uh, originators. Uh, and, and I think we'll be talking a, a bit more about that <clears throat> today. Uh, next up, uh, Representative Byron. Oh, thank you. Um, thanks for having me here this morning. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Representative Matt Byron. I uh, live in Virgens. I represent six communities in Northwest Addison County. Uh, I'm the vice chair of the House Government Operations and Military Affairs, which has the Cannabis Control Board in its committee portfolio. Um, so my background before um, becoming an elected official uh, is as a chef. Um, I'm a career food systems person. Uh, I own a restaurant in Virgens. That's my primary job. And I've spent the bulk of my career working in our farm to table movement since essentially the late 90s. Um, I've been an advocate for legalized cannabis since my teen years and have always really seen it not just as um, you know, the right thing to do to legalize the product for adult use, but I always saw it as a tremendous opportunity for uh, Vermont and the agricultural sector. Um, now, with my, my life in food systems, I've actually been drawn to some other projects where I'm a partner um, that work in the agricultural sphere. Uh, I'm a partner in a cacao project, so chocolate, nice. in the Dominican Republic. Um, and this project is organic cacao farming for select varietals, uh, post-harvest production uh, for export to, I think we're up to three, four continents now. And there's a big environmental mission to this project as well. Um, we work with local community farmers for habitat preservation, primary, primarily for uh, migratory birds, carbon sequestration, and a few other dynamics, reforestation from old slash and burn practices, et cetera. So a lot of that background um, has very similar vocabulary and function to what we're trying to do here in, in cannabis. Uh, like our select varietals um, down there is, is the same thing as propagation here, right? Um, and so now stepping forward into the legislative sphere, uh, we just passed um, out of committee last week uh, H270, which is our miscellaneous cannabis bill. Uh, we hope to do this annually. Um, the committee chair, Mike McCarthy, and I were the lead sponsors of the bill. And essentially what are we, we are doing with this piece of legislation is our market's in its infancy and we have been up and running for a short period of time, so we want to take a quick look at what's working, what's not. 
Um, I'm not gonna lie to you, I got several I told you so's <laughs> in the buckets that we're fixing. Um, so we're working on that. Um, and so, you know, I wanna really just open things up to you folks to start asking questions. I'm happy to talk about aspects of that bill, any questions that you have. Um, I mean, we really touched on points as uh, like THC contents for edibles, right? Right now you can only do five milligram gummies, 10 pieces. We're bumping that up from 50 milligrams total to 100 milligrams total. You know, something simple, but it is a crazy conversation we're having that. I expanding um, um, caregivers licenses, um, expanding allowable medical conditions. Uh, for we still have one of the most restrictive uh, uh, medical um, verification uh, criteria in the country, shockingly, uh, a propagation license so people can do starts and clones for sales and individual license, things of that nature. So I'm, I've been working very closely with um, James Pepper and his crew at the CCB, and I genuinely feel like we're making very good progress being this early in the industry. Um, so with that, Sure, yeah. Um, Tim, you want to introduce, introduce yourself sure. and then we'll uh, move on to the conversation. Good morning. My name is Timothy Egan. I'm a, I am the current chair of New Hampshire CAN, which is the trade association for the cannabis industry in the state of New Hampshire. For the previous four years before that, I was a member of the House of Representatives representing Sugar Hill, Lisbon, Lyman, Monroe, Franconia. Grafton District 2, and I was the chair of the Democratic House Cannabis Caucus, and when I got redistricted just this November, sad, um, the folks at New Hampshire CAN, who I had been consulting with, asked me to come aboard. I am from New Hampshire, or as we call it, the island of prohibition, <laughs> because one of these things is not like the other when I go to a New Hampshire, a New England CAN event, because we are the outlier. Um, my background before that, I've spent uh, about 40 years in the media business. Um, I got into cannabis business sideways. I got into, I've always been interested in sustainability and, and clean energy and got involved in a, um, an event and started working with an organization called the uh, Cannabis Certification Council focused on sustainability in the industry. And that drew me more and more interested into the cannabis world. I got elected more focused on regional economic development, and then the light bulb went off that cannabis could be regional economic development in New Hampshire. So what I would like to do is tell you a little bit of a history of why New Hampshire is still this island of prohibition. So a couple of things happened interestingly. Early on um, <clears throat> in, so the current state is that we have no recreational use. We are decriminalized up to three quarters of an ounce and that happened on July 18th, 2017. That's right, six years ago, um, or almost. So in 2013, Governor Hassan passed the medicinal cannabis law. Um, it allows for medicinal use for patients with chronic or terminal diseases, debilitating medical conditions, and the bill was noted as one of the stricter medical marijuana bills in the nation, allowing cannabis only after any other treatment methods have failed. Um, part of that dovetails with, as some of you may know, New Hampshire has had a tremendous opioid problem. So there's a level of fear. So when we get down to why is New Hampshire still the island prohibition, one of them is the level of fear that still exists in our state. We have now only five medicinal cannabis facilities. There are only five dispensaries available to consumers. So some progress moved along. Um, there was some hope with this medicinal passage, but in 2014, uh, we got very close. The House passed a, a bill that would legalize personal use up to an ounce, and for those over 20 years of old, 21 years or older, and production and sale that was licensed facilities and dispensaries. But that failed in the Senate because our Senate at that point was a conservative-run Republican Party oversaw the House and the Senate. There was more moderate Republicans in the House to pass it, um, but in the Senate it failed. So then it moved along and uh, we changed governors. Um, governor Hassan became Senator Hassan, Chris Sununu became the governor, and one of his hallmarks, and he will say, oh, I'm, I was, I'm, I'm the 
most friendly governor to cannabis that New Hampshire has ever had, because in 2017, he passed decriminalization, which is um, charges you $100 for the first or second offense and $300 for the third offense um, within three years, which is a misdemeanor, and it's basically a, a traffic ticket for uh, possession up to an ounce. So again, hope in New Hampshire, right? We now have decrim. We're, we're getting there. But that, again, failed in the Senate. Again, two things happened in the Senate. Opioid crisis still boiling up in the state of New Hampshire. Lots of fear. Um, and change, no change in the legislature. Um, still conservative run House and Senate. So conservatives. Uh, sort of that just say no Reagan mindset still prevails. Um, so it fails again. So I, being in the House and joined in November 2018, um, had some experience working with our um, majority leader. The House transitioned to a Democratic House, still a Senate, was Republican. So there was a strong effort to push forward um, a legalization bill. I worked with uh, Representative Rennie Cushing, who was our House Majority Leader, um, and he basically patterned a bill very much after what Massachusetts had built. The problem is that in the state of New Hampshire, we have no sales tax, we have no income tax, um, we have no capital gains tax, we have now no interest and dividend tax. So it's very hard to create a big state agency in a small state agency style government. So while that bill had support in the House, it didn't have a lot of support in the Senate. Um, I had the pleasure of working with um, the Senate, uh, with Representative Cushing um, on a few bills, uh, supported his effort. Um, actually, uh, I give him, um, and he's no longer with us, so I, I toast to him. Um, he was able to overturn the death penalty in the state of New Hampshire, was able to galvanize both parties for that. Uh, so his next job was, I'm going to take on cannabis. And they actually asked me, because I had worked with him on that bill, on the death penalty, to try and motivate legislators on both sides of the aisle. You know, I'm a traditionally a, a business guy from the television business. So, you know, I understand, you know, low taxation and low cost energy and things that Republicans might like to hear. So he sort of said, great, you're a guy in sort of the middle aisle here. You're not on the left, you're not on the right. I need you to do this for me. So I built a House Cannabis Caucus and about 70 members of the Democratic Party, about 30 members of the Republican Party. So we created, he had this bill that was a little too big. And so while it passed in the House with Democratic control, it didn't pass in the Senate. So now we move on a little bit and um, I'm now into 2019 um, and we, that 2020, sorry, I was 2019, I moved into 2021, we elected, and now, again, we're back to a Republican majority in the House, a Republican majority in the Senate, but lo and behold, there are some Republicans that have sort of changed their stripes. Some of you may have heard of the Free State Movement in New Hampshire. I'm not a big fan of it, I'll say it publicly, uh, but one of the things that Free Staters like in a, having free everything is free right to grow and smoke whatever they want. So now I have political relationships that I have to leverage, libertarians, free staters, who are pro-cannabis. So the Republicans actually filed a horrible bill that I stood up on the House floor and I supported, like literally choking back, you know, my, my saliva because it was a state-run cannabis commission. They wanted to create a state-run agency. And I'm, I'm thinking to myself, the small libertarian no-tax state wants to create their own cannabis state agency. <laughs> Vertically operated, I mean, where's the transparency? They're gonna test their own product, they're gonna grow their own product, they're gonna sell their own product, they're gonna price their own product. Passed in the house, overwhelming voice vote. We didn't even have to, you know, click your, your little, what they call division vote or a roll call where you have to personally be accountable. Voice vote, overwhelming voice vote. I think there were like three dissenters. Goes to the Senate, Senate 
manipulates the bill as they normally do, it ends up losing 13 to 11. That was a blessing in disguise, in my opinion, right? I can't say I'm for cannabis and not vote for a cannabis bill. I felt that I would be disingenuous to all the folks that I've been talking to for the last three years saying, this is why I want to pass, you know, why we should have legalized cannabis. I wasn't really a fan of the process and the logic was, let's get cannabis passed and if it's a state run agency, sort of state run operation, they'll realize at some point they need private industry to help them with this. So luckily it failed in the Senate. Um, so where we are now, you know, still with prohibition. Um, but what's different this year is two things. Um, everybody has caught up to us. So now the pressure is on New Hampshire, right? Instead of us worrying about how are we going to build an industry that can ma maximize revenue and serve the constituents who want cannabis, we're now looking at we're losing revenue. People are leaving the state of New Hampshire to go buy cannabis in Maine and Massachusetts and Vermont. So now it's a, a bit of a dire straits issue. Like, are we not going to figure out how to create revenue? So what we created is a House Bill 639. Um, usually cannabis bills in the House end up at public safety, right, because they're a legal issue. Um, we built a coalition of the willing, I like to say. I have in the same room agreeing on things, the American for, Americans for Prosperity and the ACLU. When you talk about politics as strange bedfellows, that's how we're gonna try and get it done. We've built an expansive coalition, organizations that are in the past have been prohibitionist oriented, who basically have now created principles saying, we could live with cannabis if you do these things, you know, farther away from schools, control the advertising, and we're getting them engaged. We're getting the medicinal industry who has always feared adult rec because they feel that they're gonna lose business. We adjusted the bill so that they could have dual licensure, right? they could own a, a medicinal and they could own a for-profit. For and so a lot of those things built into our bill, which was 41 pages, not 400, right? Because in New Hampshire, created this bill, brought it to my two colleagues that I had worked with, House Minority Leader, Democrat, House Majority Leader, Libertarian Free Stater, got them to sign on, because I knew they were both pro-cannabis, and I said, this is the way it's gonna work. We need to have bipartisan support. We've built this coalition of bipartisan groups but we threw out expungement. We threw out a small business investment. We threw out special uh, dispensations for farmers and veterans. That's, that 41 page bill is now 28 pages. But it's what we can do to get it passed because why are we there, right? New Hampshire is, I like to say, purple and white. We're very reddish purple politically, right? Very conservative. There's still that old school mindset. Yeah, our, on the license plate it says live free or die. You'd think cannabis, no brainer. <laughs> and we're predominantly very white. We're predominantly very old. Uh, New England, uh, in Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine, they all have the same issue. They are the three, three of the four oldest states by population in the nation. And so Vermont's not seeing any inward migration Mean isn't either, right? More deaths and births. But what's New Hampshire seeing? Lots of inward migration from older folks because they're coming here because we don't have a tax structure that taxes their retirement. So what we're doing is we're getting, again, in our legislature, average age of 63. You know, you think, oh, those are hippies. No, they're conservative, conservative, older, fiscally social, uh, fiscally responsible. They call themselves fiscally responsible folks. So. We still have that sort of mindset. And so that's something that we have to fight, but there's been some progress and literally in the last two months and up, up into Wednesday. So House Bill 639 passed through our Commerce Committee. We didn't go through, we convinced the leadership uh, because we have the majority leader on board, don't put it into public safety, put it into commerce. It's a business bill. Much more understanding of the business of, of cannabis passed out of the, that committee with a 19 to one vote, went to the House floor, won by 104 votes. We have the third largest governing body in the, his, in the, in the nation, sorry, in the, in, the, in the world. 
between Congress, U.S. Congress, New Hampshire, 400 members of the House of Representatives, 24 senators, yeah. So, but by, when you win by 104 votes, that's three short of veto-proof. That's a key, because if, if you know our governor, he's always saying, oh, we haven't researched it enough, I don't know if it's right, and we have this opioid crisis. So we have to focus on veto-proof. Now, Bill, as of Monday, went through House Ways and Means. Uh, we have a work session on that, but there's a lot of progress that supported that. We have a House bill that passed overwhelming on a voice vote for um, growing for patients. We had a libertarian bill passed just this Wednesday on a voice vote, legalization of cannabis. And if you read into the bill, it basically just says, it's legal, no rules, no requirements, no agencies, no licenses. I'm like, oh, so we can drive on the other side of the road now and it doesn't matter. Right? Yeah, I don't like a lot of, New Hampshire doesn't like a lot of rules, but you gotta have some. But what that says is the prevailing wind now is there seems to be interest to move it forward. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of a history lesson because I don't have legal cannabis to talk about and, and the structure going forward. My fight is making it happen and all the things that have to go into a bill to bring it to, you know, to our, to our constituents which voted or uh, responded to a survey, 83% of the state in favor of legalization of cannabis. 90% Democrats, 82, 80% 80 independents, 68% Republicans. So that's where we're at. Thanks, Ben, for letting me to give a little history lesson. Since oh. we're at a college, I thought that would be the appropriate thing to do. <laughs> Absolutely, and I, I think my students know that I'm a big fan of um, providing uh, context. Um, yeah, we see here these incredible examples of the iterative process that is lawmaking, right? The real strategic and practical effort in working to legalize and working to refine and at times perhaps working to repair. Um, and, and that is really exciting for me and I, and I hope for all of you. Um, I have my own list of questions, but I think um, it makes sense really to start with all of yours and also to introduce you, our panel panelists, to, to speak to what may have come to mind as, as we were all speaking. Are there questions from the group at this point? Yeah, I have a question for Jason after the student. Sure. Hello. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Timothy, I was just wondering, is it off the table to have a state-owned uh, cannabis industry now? Yes. Okay. The current bill, House Bill 639, is the closest I can tell you is it's actually patterned now after the state of Vermont. We created a bill that would have created an independent dispensary, uh, independent commission, um, because Commerce and the Overseas the Liquor Commission, there was sort of a brokering um, which we had to sort of swallow. It wasn't that terrible. But now, in the language of the bill, New Hampshire Liquor Commission will become the New Hampshire Liquor and Cannabis Commission. So the licensure offerings, the oversight would all run through the Liquor Commission, which is, I think, a big step of acceptance by our state government and hopefully by our governor that it's not an independent agency. We're not. Again, because we're not a, a, we're a big tax state, they didn't want to create another layer of bureaucracy. So it's folded into that bill, into that agency, and the bill has a lot of the enforcement aspects, which are, I imagine, you know, my other um, panelists could talk about, that are all rolled into under the Liquor Commission, which makes it almost a little easier to roll out when you're looking at you know, ID checks and background checks and all those things, Liquor Commission already does that for stores that sell beer, wine. Um, if you remember, if anyone doesn't know, New Hampshire has liquor stores for liquor only, like hard liquor, and then beer and wine are sold at, at other folks that have to get licenses. So we're lucky that it's a commission within a division. You don't see that overlapping or affecting uh, cannabis needing to be sold like liquor is sold? You see that happening even if it's not state owned but that it has to be sold as liquor is? 
from a state agency? Well, what the bill? Like control state style. Yeah. The, what the no the um, the liquor commission would oversee it like the Vermont Cannabis Commission. They would take in applications for licenses. They would vet them and then growers and dispensaries and cultivators and manufacturers would have their own business. It would not be a state business, that, but just that agency would run it instead of having to create a separate agency. So we're sort of a little, I would say now a little bit of the best world for New Hampshire because if we don't have to convince conservative legislators, spend money on a new agency, but just expand a product line within the Liquor Commission, that's really what our play is. Thank you. Can I actually just touch on that for one second? Because I, I think what you were asking was like, will a state run the like sale and distribution of cannabis as a product to the outlets? We looked into that. So this is my first year in the community of jurisdiction with the Cannabis Control Board. I spent the last four years as the primary point person for the Department of Liquor and Lottery. And now when I moved to the Committee of Government Operations and Military Affairs, that portfolio came with me for all sort of the licensure overlays, compliance overlays, of you know taxing regulating and monitoring a controlled substance right so four years ago we did briefly take a look at doing a control state model which is what we have both have for alcohol and it got flagged because it's still federally illegal so i remember saying to our legislative council so like a delivery driver could get grabbed for intent to distribute like from our you know state warehouse to a state retail and he said no he could get arrested for distribution. <laughs> and the entire legislature could get theoretically exposed to a um, RICO charge. <laughs> yeah, that's what, that's what killed our, that's that bill. That's federal problem. That's what killed that bill in the Senate, was the Senate said, Big so problem. basically basically you're putting all our liquor employees and their pension funds at risk of the federal government because it's federally illegal. And, like I said, a bill that I, you know, swallowed my pride to vote yes for, I was like, oh, thank you, Senate. For once, you actually killed something that I cared, that I cared got killed. Yeah, yeah. Good morning. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to the complications and intersections between legal cannabis and gun laws. I know a guy out in North Dakota who had some sort of like controlling stake in a medical marijuana distribution and won a shotgun at a Ducks Unlimited raffle and we went to go pick it up. They're like, we can't give this to you because you're in the cannabis industry. I'll start, we should all comment. Yeah. Have you been to New Hampshire? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, New Hampshire voted a house bill that I voted against to deny any state agency to follow President Biden's gun presidential uh, items. So in our bill, it's, there's a specific line that says it does not preclude anyone from owning anything else. I mean, I'm working with the chair of the Libertarian Party, who is the House Majority Leader. So it's, you know, separated out and if there was ever any kind of inkling that gun laws could impact cannabis, the bill would go nowhere. So we've, I, 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 the, uh, the Democrat in me has, again, sort of had to swallow my pride on an issue. Um, so, so in New Hampshire, we don't have that, I don't say that concern because Republicans aren't gonna let that factor into the bill. So I think one of the things that might have flagged that situation is, um, the form for a background check, which is a federal form, you have to disclose whether or not you use any illicit drugs and cannabis is on that punch list. So the individual perhaps got jammed up because of that intersection between being on a license for an operation and then having to fill out the disclosure form, which may have required him filling it out inaccurately. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's a federal law, right? And so in order to fill out that form, if you answer honestly that you're a medical patient, for example, that's where it comes up the most, then you would be denied the gun rights, right? But it wouldn't affect your ability to be a patient. So it doesn't operate the other direction. Like if you own a gun, you can't be denied a medical patient license. I'll, I'll add on to that. I've been trying to get it to load here, and I can't. It's form um, 
4473, and what's interesting about this is that it, this is specifically relating to the transfer of firearms, right? So that situation where you're trying to pick up a shotgun. And so there are quite a few questions about uh, what that means as to firearms that may already be in someone's possession, um, and, and some states in certain situations where you may uh, be permitted to engage in, in individual uh, gifting transactions and the like, uh, and it can get pretty messy. And separately, there's this overarching consideration with all of this, right, which is federal prosecutorial discretion, right? <laughs> and this idea that our entire multi-billion dollar uh, national state legal industry is predicated at the moment on A.G. Garland essentially saying in a press conference, our primary focus right now is on interstate trade. And so when it comes, we do still have laws on the books that would allow for firearm enhancements in the event that someone were to start um, filing federal charges against state legal operators. We don't have any reason to think that would happen. And it's this funny moment of tension in the law, right? I get asked all the time, um, well, cannabis is federally illegal. Aren't you worried about getting arrested as a cannabis lawyer? And I think, you know, by the time they're putting Tim Egan in jail on RICO <laughs> charges, right? By the time they're putting Matt Byron in jail on RICO charges, I'd rather hang out with these guys in jail. You know, that's kind of my thinking on the thing. So um, that's uh, be a fun that's, party. Yeah. yeah, that's that's the state of things. But it, it represents that real ongoing tension between the many areas in which um, uh, cannabis uh, prohibition under the Controlled Substances Act ends up having these sort of. Uh, results that don't make a lot of sense. And I'll just say that it is the world's largest selective enforcement experiment in the history of humanity <laughs> that the majority of states are just going to flagrantly violate it. The federal government is not going to enforce it. This coal memo, this memo, right? Like, it's just an example of what we can do with law. <laughs> yeah, I think because of the national polling is, you know, 80% of folks are pro-cannabis, yet we still have only 21 states with legalization. Uh, other que question in the back. Good morning. Uh, thank you guys first for all of your work. Really good question. And I'll just say is uh, for all you law students, you'll learn that any good lawyer will, will tell you the answer depends. Um, <laughs> I wanted to specifically ask uh, Rep Byrong um, how much you're looking at other states and their market compression um, certainly, if you go to the West Coast, you've seen markets crater. You can go in the Midwest, Michigan. You can get a pound of distillate for $100 right now in the regulated market. And for those of you that don't know, that's a really small amount of money for a pound <laughs> of distilled 100% THC. Um, so I'm just curious how much you're, you're pulling from that. Even in Massachusetts, which historically, to the degree that there is history, has been a, a somewhat robust market, is, is also seeing compression. How are you planning for that in your tax schemes and other regulation, a regulatory environment to keep the industry viable? Because to be clear, in most states, the industry is not profitable. No, all very valid points. Uh, so a little like historic context on, on me and cannabis's policy. So as I mentioned, this is the first time I'm in the committee with the CCB. Um, but I've been doing Department of Liquor and Lottery for a long time in my industry, in hospitality. I, I understood the license structures and whatnot. Um, so I was always a proponent of there being a cap on, uh, especially the retail licenses. I originally wanted to do about 20 or 25 and then revisit after a few years. Um, I did not have that bill in my committee of jurisdiction. Um, that ship sailed. So I have a lot of concerns about oversaturation of the market at the retail point primarily. Um, you know, we are actually seeing a short supply on flour and other products right now. So that's, I'm not saying it's not a concern, it's less of a concern. So I cited these examples out west in the earlier markets, Oregon, et cetera, um, fell on deaf ears. So what do we do now, right? Um, so now as we're taking a look at things like event permits, um, so you could have like a bud tender at a wedding, we could have like a cannabis fest perhaps, like we do a brewer's fest. Um, the way that off-site alcohol is allowed for functions like that is you have to have a bar license, a third class liquor license. And then you have another license which allows you to serve off-site catering license. Now, the way I'm seeing these event permits 
kind of leading into your point or your question, is an extension of the retail license. So they are already used to IDing, they're already used to serving people, they understand their product lines. So what I'm trying to do right now is to find um, ways of structuring licenses to help support the retailers because I'm really concerned about an oversaturation of the market at that point. I have some thoughts on that as well. Yeah. What's that? The bigger problem will be with supply. Like retailers go out of business, so what? We haven't, but we haven't seen that problem with the supply yet. But I think that's in part due to a lack of interstate commerce and creating cultivation facilities in places that shouldn't have massive cultivation facilities. Like we don't grow avocados in Vermont for a reason, right? And if the price of avocados drop because more people are growing avocados, that's capitalism. Like drug policy can't solve racism or capitalism. And what the profits you're talking about are all the profits that existed because of prohibition. It's an agricultural product at its core. And the idea that it would be $2,000 a pound for a pound of cannabis doesn't make agricultural sense. So we're trying to protect the profits that are there because it's illegal everywhere else. And eventually, every agricultural product becomes compressed and not costs a lot of money per pound for that product. But the people that benefit are the manufacturers and the consumers, right? The fact that patients can now buy cannabis for much less money means that they're able to get the medicine that they need to live a long, healthy life without having to break the bank or go out of business themselves paying for cannabis costs. So I've heard this idea idea that the compression of the price per pound is this tragedy, but I think it's the natural result of legalization. Like we should have been expecting that the whole time. And like, for example, in Connecticut, an unlimited size cultivation facility, like the moment interstate commerce happens, all of those people are gonna go out of business. There is no way that they're gonna be able to compete with California or Florida or any of these other places. But if again, if somebody opened up a coconut farm in Connecticut, I'd be like, that's probably a bad idea. It's not the best place to grow coconuts and the market isn't really there to have that scale of coconut growth. And so I actually think that we should welcome that compression. That is capitalism playing out. Some businesses will fall and some businesses will succeed, but the people, the general population are going to benefit from a product that has an accurate price point for an agricultural product. And if I'm lobbying for the cannabis industry, I'm having them tell the federal government, you want deschedulization, not legalization. Because what that does is it allows states to run their own operation that they've invested in, right? It allows states to think states' rights, if I don't want cannabis, I can vote it down. But, to, you know, there's 20 some odd states that have made serious investments and have businesses make serious investments and rely on new revenue. So the potential of, of Legalization over deschedulization and, and interstate commerce, you know, can, will radically change the industry. And, and, and you're right, that compression of, of the marketplace is a scary thing. It's the roller coaster, right? We're coming up. The, we're coming up. There's a lot of fun, and then we're going to go down screaming because, <laughs> or maybe it won't be so drastic. But it's it's a good point. Yeah. Um, one more piece on that. Like so, I. I don't think the future of cultivation in Vermont is with large scale growing. Uh, we have always had for decades a reputation as one of the best points of origin for quality cannabis. And I said reputation, you can judge the quality. <laughs> um, but, you know, if somebody in the illegal market back in the day drove an ounce down to Boston from New Hampshire or Vermont, they were going to get a premium just because of point of origin. So we have that reputation as sort of cannabis heady topper. So when we were originally doing um, our first bill that got the retail market up and running, and I, and I did vote against this bill because there were so many, in my mind, flaws to it. But one of the things I really pushed for, which happened, was an increase footprint for our uh, craft growers licenses. And they were doing the math on consumption in the state. And I told them that they were playing the curve wrong because we had to be ready to scale up with these craft growers when we opened up interstate commerce and that we had to be, we didn't need to be bogged down legislatively. We had to allow them to scale quickly with quality product that they were ready to move at that, at that pace, at that volume. Because if we don't capture that window of opportunity, it's gonna disappear. 
but we already have in the legacy market a, a broad ranging reputation as an origin point of quality product. And in my mind, that is, that is what we need to focus on is boutique and not volume. Um, towards that end, and I know we're just about out of time. <clears throat> um, you know, I, I, I get asked quite a bit about the um, future of the cannabis industry and what it might look like. By dollars, we're looking at a product that um, tracks pretty closely to beer. At least that's where the projections are. And I think in terms of industry structure, we may end up looking at a product that tra tracks pretty closely to wine, where you have your, you know, gas station wine and your yellowtails and your franzias, and you also have your um, agritourism wineries, right? You have uh, your craft producers, you have the, um, uh, the, the international competitions for quality um, and, and a lot of variance there and opportunities for those smaller, uh, for those smaller market participants um, to really stay in the game if they're um, willing to think creatively and have appropriate state support. And there are interesting programs going on here in Vermont, certainly in the Pacific Northwest and in other places that are really uh, supporting that. Um, I think we're just about at time. Thank you all so much uh, for, for attending, for sharing your thoughts. Uh, it looks like we have one last question. Yeah, we can't let my yeah, colleague, Dr. Lamy, who built the cannabis, I have to give him credit, uh, Dr. Phil Lamy built the cannabis studies program at Castleton University. Indeed. And, and I'm, proud to, I'm proud to say it's working within our other four, three other institutions as the college has become the new Vermont State University. So he, we have to hear from him. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. And uh, I didn't do it alone, by, by the way. There was lots of other people involved. And one of the things Tim didn't say is Tim teaches uh, our can of business course in the, uh, in the program. Uh, but I, I had a question uh, for Jason. Earlier, uh, when you introduced your, yourself, you made a comment about uh, that interstate commerce of can cannabis is going to be happening and probably sooner than you expect. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm curious. That, that really surprised me. What makes you so optimistic about that? Uh, the lawsuits have started. Um, but I also just think that in my conversations with the folks, especially on the West Coast, they've started to enter into interstate compacts at a state level. And Oregon, California, those are the places that are really moving forward on that. And it is technically possible any state right now could enter into an interstate compact, but it's legal or not, right? That will be up for challenge. But there's a movement to make it happen. And governments are doing it. The other thing is, I, again, I'm not a lawyer. This is for all of y'all to write your thesis on. But I believe it was always legal, and the state prohibitions are what is illegal. So if I were to actually test it, if as a legal entity I ship my chocolate bar publicly, I think we would win that challenge. And so seeing it happen now and seeing the folks that have been around the space and seeing governments actually move forward on it, I feel like it's been vetted pretty seriously and that that's what's going to happen. But this New York lawsuit is challenging it directly. And so the results of that lawsuit, I believe, will determine whether or not interstate commerce will be legal via court rather than via legislation. Would that, um, would that be the legalization through the states? I, mean, I can see how uh, a state like uh, Vermont you know, could trade with, uh, say, New Hampshire if they legalize or, or Massachusetts. But what about states that might be in between where it's not legal yet? So we're going to find out, right, that that state would have its own laws of how it wants to handle what happens if an entity from another state were to come in. You could look at also like dry counties, right? There are places that don't allow alcohol in that space. However, people are allowed to drive through those spaces in order to get there. Another complicating factor is tribal law and the tribe's ability to be interstate operators even of themselves because they're actually ones that are tribal-owned entities that span multiple states. And so there's giving a lot of those issues of how do we rectify all these different pieces if I start a cannabis entity at a tribe, right, and like be able to move it around. But I do think the dormant commerce clause applies to illegal activity. And I think that's the biggest issue that needs to get worked out is can the states violate the dormant commerce clause ever? Right? And, and that their current prohibitions on interstate commerce violate the Dormant Commerce Clause. And I think that's the big question that is going to come out of this lawsuit. And if and when that happens, all the states have to immediately react, and the entities, the, the businesses, will be able to move forward, right? And you'll have entities like Amazon, Walmart, right? Like a lot of these other places that have been waiting for that particular moment to jump in. So that's why I think. I think this lawsuit is going to be the determining factor, and I think when that happens, the speed at which folks are going to turn around and move on it is going to be wild, because now you'll be able to ship cannabis from California, you know, 
all to Texas or other large states. And right now, one of the production problems is outside of California, all of the states that have really high production are not the biggest populations, right? It's the smaller states like Oregon that are overproducing. If they're able to drive a truck from there to New York City, right, it's really gonna disrupt the market. And, you know, the folks that are pushing the, the, the lawsuit, Cureleaf, GTI, and others, are very well resourced, very large entities, and I think that they know exactly what they're doing uh, when they put that lawsuit forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you all. Um, and on that note, we're, uh, we're quite a bit over time, so I'll say thank you to uh, Jason Ortiz, yes. to Matt Byron, and Tim Egan. Um, thank you, Ben. Thanks very much. That was great. Yeah, can we get a picture? Can someone take a picture?
Okay, everybody, we're going to get started again. I'd like to introduce you to Nick from Vermont Normal. Hey, everybody. How y'all doing? Very good. Thank you. I hope everybody who's had a nice St. Patty's Day was able to enjoy something green. So, my name is Nick Shorman, and I am from Vermont Normal. Um, and before I get started today, I just want to thank the organizers of this conference for putting this all together. Uh, I think this is a fantastic event um, that Vermont hasn't seen the likes of ever. And would love to do it again next year and the year after. So thank you guys. Um, today I'm going to be talking about uh, federal cannabis regulation, an overview. Um, but as someone pointed out earlier, really delving into the history um, of what the regulation has looked like on the federal level. Um, and, you know, how we have gotten to those points in history. Um, and yeah, so next slide, please. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, my introduction to cannabis in Vermont uh, was, you know, my freshman year at University of Vermont. And, you know, more professionally, um, as an internship um, where I was sent to the State House of Montpelier um, multiple times a week to cover S-54. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar, S-54 um, was the tax and regulate bill that was passed and signed that we now know as recreational cannabis here in Vermont. Um, so from an early, you know, from early on, I was able to get a good understanding of what the market would look like simply on pen and paper, kind of give me an idea of how it would play out, you know, before, before the first sale was made or before the uh, first uh, cannabis control board member was appointed. Um, and uh, after that, I worked for the Chittenden County Public Defender's Office. Um, which gave me a, a first-hand experience, um, you know, being the first point of contact for um, our clients who, you know, were marginalized members of society and seeing how they were engaging with the criminal justice system um, for a variety of, of issues um, was, you know, quite eye-opening and a fantastic learning experience. And so those two experiences combined um, led me to working in uh, canvas advocacy, specifically with a social equity approach because um, I felt like at the time uh, that was something that was kind of missing from the table of cannabis advocacy in Vermont. So with the help of my colleague Ella, who is sitting right here, as well as two other uh, fantastic people who aren't here today, Kylie and Sherelle, uh, we all started Vermont Normal in February of 2021. Um, and here we are today. So, you know, why is the history of cannabis important? So, you know, Cannabis is a unique product, if you will. It has both been treated as an agricultural product and has also been weaponized in our society um, to marginalize certain groups. Um, and, uh, you know, its regulation, as we're going to go over in this presentation, has greatly protected large, um, big business interests, if you will, um, at the harm of small farmers, uh, specifically, um, you know, not specifically, but, you know, in Vermont. And I think this is an aspect of cannabis history that often gets overlooked, is the agricultural component of it. Um, now, you know, we're finally going to finish with understanding sort of the why. Um, so each state that has legalized cannabis, whether medicinally uh, or recreationally, has answered that why question. Why have they done it? Has it been for patients' rights? Has it been for criminal justice reform? Has it been for job creation? Um, and looking at the federal government, we are still yet to know the answer to that why question. Why is the federal government either going to or not going to legalize cannabis? I think is a very important question to understand, not necessarily have the answer to, but to have a, you know, an understanding of the question is going to give us a sense of what's to come in the future. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So quick overview of the presentation. Um, going to be talking about the differences between hemp and cannabis as those differences you know, relate to how they are regulated. Uh, going into the early history, so talking about, you know, the mid 18th century into the early 20th century, and then major regulatory events which occurred in the 20th century, and finally finishing with where we are today. Next slide, please. So, hemp versus cannabis, what is the difference? So, 
Hemp is a federally legal agricultural product. Um, that's a very important distinction to know. Um, whereas cannabis, on the other hand, is a Schedule I drug and narcotic. Um, and chemically speaking, the major differences between the two is that hemp contains less than 0.3% of THC. THC is a psychoactive substance compound in um, the plant that gets you high. So to give you an idea of the scale, cannabis, on the other hand, which contains greater than 0.3%, is capped in Vermont at 30%. So just to give you an idea of like the range that we're talking here, it's quite large. But you know, typically, you won't see anything lower you know, than 10 11%, so in that range. Um, now, hemp is a magical, fantastic agricultural product that can be used for a huge variety of uses. So hemp can be used to make things like rope. It can be used to make things like clothing, um, biofuels, insulation. You know, it is not inconceivable to think that we could all be sitting in this room surrounded by four walls made of hemp, sitting on chairs made out of hemp, wearing clothes made from hemp. Um, it, is, it is relatively cheap. It is easy to grow, and it grows like a weed. So, um, you know, cannabis, on the other hand, Hemp also, you know, does have medicinal uses. Uh, CBD products are often derived from hemp. Um, and, you know, cannabis, um, like I said, is a Schedule I drug. Um, it has a, a greater amount of the psychoactive substance THC as well as other cannabinoids. Um, it is, like I said, a Schedule I drug, federally legal, but legal in 21 states in the District of Columbia. Uh, next slide, please. So cannabis and hemp in early America was rather ubiquitous. Um, it was used medicinally in products like this, cannabis uh, indica, um, you know, as extracts that, was, that were sold across the United States. Um, it was used, like I said, to make things like rope, things to make uh, sails. The shipbuilders would use it quite often. Um, but, you know, you see this picture of George Washington says, I grew hemp. That's true. George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and others of the time grew hemp on their personal properties. Um, now, you know, you might think that this dollar bill was printed on hemp. It is not, but it is not inconceivable to think that it could have been. Um, but interestingly enough, one of the first copies, the drafts of the Declaration of Independence, written by Thomas Jefferson, was printed on hemp paper. Um, that just kind of goes to show the scale and the acceptance for which that this was grown. Um, you know, it is not incorrect to think that hemp and cannabis at the time was no more an intoxicating, you know, feature of society than we think of corn or soy today. Um, it was kind of just a part in everyday life. Next slide, please. So the timeline of major events, as we see here, I'll go over each of them, but there's one thing I wanted to point out. Um, before we hit 1930, cannabis hits the books in terms of regulation in California, ironically, in 1915. 1915, California became the first state to criminalize the possession of uh, cannabis. This was actually caught up in an anti-opium law um, that was passed at the time. So cannabis was kind of stuck in there accidentally, if you will. Um, and then between then and 1930, various other states, mainly along the Mexican border and in the western part of the United States, outlawed the possession of cannabis and hemp. But in 1930, uh, cannabis hits the scene, if you will, in um, the federal sense, when Congress created the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, um, which was headed by Air Harry Anslinger. Then in 1937, the first regulations were passed with the Marijuana Tax Act. Um, in 1970, a new chapter of cannabis regulation uh, is started with the Controlled Substance Act signed by President Nixon. Um, and then in 1996, you know, things begin to change. California, who was the first state uh, to criminalize cannabis, was the first state to also set up a medical system, um, which we're going to go into later. And between then and 2012, we see a variety of decriminalization measures as well as uh, medical systems being set up in states across the country. Sorry, that's cut off. But And then we get into 2023, where we have some federal bills that are moving towards legalization in a variety of ways. And you know that variety kind of accounts for that why question that I brought up earlier, which we're going to go into later. Um, next slide, please. So this man here, this is Harry Anslinger, who infamously once said that marijuana is the most violence-causing drug in the history of mankind. 
Um, so when Congress created the Federal Bureau of Narcotics in 1930, they put Harry Anslinger as his deputy commissioner. You know, his job was to kind of set the tone for you know how narcotics in general are going to be regulated in the United States, and uh, you know he was able to kind of seize upon um, many Americans you know pre-existing racism that existed in the 1930s in the United States you know under Jim Crow, um, and uh, you know using using that you know racism he put out a highly I hate to say it successful propaganda campaign. Um, which painted the users of cannabis as uh, sexually deviant, violent, um, and you know, for lack of a better word, it was highly successful. Now, it is known that in the early days of his career, you know, Harry Anslinger knew that marijuana cannabis was not this bad. It was not this insane, you know, rage and fueled drug that he painted it out to be. But he knew that being the commissioner of this new agency that you know, the viability of his career was somewhat in jeopardy and that he needed to secure future funding as, you know, via public support. So he created this somewhat arbitrary media campaign, somewhat, ar you know, extremely arbitrary media campaign um, that, like I said, painted the users of cannabis and marijuana as being, you know, violent and sexually deviant. Um, and as a result of that, he's widely considered to be the father of the war on drugs. Um, so, you know, on the next slide, we're going to see some examples of this propaganda. So this left article um, was printed by the New York Times in 1927. It reads, Mexican family go insane. Five said to have been stricken by eating marijuana. Now, this was the New York Times. This was a highly respected publication. Um, it just goes to show the, the, the amount of ignorance that existed at this time and the lack of research that people were doing. Um, and on the right, we have a poster that was often used, um, whether you know, put on billboards or whether it was put in newspapers. It shows those who, you know, it depicts the marijuana smokers as quite literally the devil, um, which is where we get the term devil's lettuce from. And the victim um, was a common pattern is a white woman. Um, you know, these images were used commonly, um, like I said, to draw support for Harry Anslinger and his um, newly appointed commission, um, and eventually for what was to come next, which, oh, next slide, please. I have just a quick clip from the trailer to Reefer Madness, and if possible, I would love to play the first just 15 seconds from it, um, but before I just want to give some context that this was a movie that was put together by a church group um, that was to depict, you know, the users of, of marijuana, as we're going to see, as just, like, insane. Um, and it was later touted by, I believe, President Herbert Hoover as one of the greatest cinematic pieces of, you know, history ever made. Um, so just first 50, no, can't get it? All right. Well, I'll give you an idea. The, the young kids are having a hop at the soda fountain, right? Some dude goes off in the back to smoke weed, and like pretty much all of a sudden, psh, horns pop up out of his head, all right? <laughs> to give you an idea of what we're, what we're dealing with at the time. Um, so this was in 1936, and in 1937, we have the first regulation on the book. Next slide, please. So in 1937, Congress um, passed is the Marijuana Tax Act. Now, this is a very interesting piece of legislation for a variety of reasons. Um, this bill was simultaneously anti-farmer, pro-big business, as well as racially discriminatory. Um, so essentially what the act did was it required anyone who was to grow and then distribute hemp commercially to acquire a, a stamp from the U.S. Department of Treasury and the Internal Revenue Service, um, which would allow them to do so um, and avoid paying extremely high fines. So if you had this stamp, you were paying something like a dollar per ounce on moving it. Um, and if you didn't have the stamp, you were looking at, I think, $100 um, to move this product commercially. And the stamp itself was not cheap. Um, now, like I said, by this time, many states had already outlawed cannabis um, and just its possession. What this did was it outlawed the agricultural production and commercial sale of hemp. Um, 
Now, interestingly enough, one of the bigger um, proponents for this bill was a man named William Randolph Hearst. Um, William Randolph Hearst was a huge media magnate, mogul at the time. He owned, uh, you know, huge newspapers uh, across the country, but he also owned the supply chain for newspapers. Now, what I mean by that is he owned the newspapers and he owned the timber holdings that would supply the paper for those newspapers, right? Randolph Hearst correctly saw hemp in its production to make things like paper as a huge threat to his business. Now, you know, hemp, like I said, is a very cheap product to, to, to produce, bringing it in from Mexico, bringing it in from, you know, some of the warmer states down south, out west. You know, he was, and his business entities were extremely threatened by the production of hemp. So, directly or indirectly, he used his connections and lobbied in D.C. to have this bill passed, and it extremely cut down on the domestic production of hemp and the, you know, importation of it from Mexico. Um, and it just goes to show, you know, that like many things, like, like throughout history in the U.S., you know, big business will always find a way. Um, so Marijuana Tax Act signed and passed in 1937, and it extremely limited the production of hemp by small farmers uh, in the United States. Uh, next slide, please. Now, interestingly enough, as we go into the early 40s, the U.S. is finding itself, um, you know, in the thralls of World War II. And the U.S. Department of Agriculture begins a program called Hemp for Victory. Now, again, hemp is this fantastic agricultural product that can be used for so many things. And the U.S. federal government knew that. So what they did, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, in conjunction with, you know, with the military, um, gave out draft deferments to small farmers across the United States in return that they would grow hemp for the wartime efforts. They distributed seeds to small-scale farmers from the U.S. federal government um, and in return for, you know, for growing and processing hemp for things like uniforms, parachutes, you know, other military items, um, these farmers could defer the draft. Um, and it is believed that I think by 1943, something like nearly 400,000 acres of hemp was being planted in the United States, um, which I don't know the exact previous numbers, but is an insane uptick from the early days of the Marijuana Tax Act. So it just goes to show, you know, when it works in their favor, are going to use it. Um, next slide, please. So the Marijuana Tax Act is, you know, it is in play throughout the 40s and 50s um, and into the 60s. And, you know, the 1960s is a very unique time for drug culture. You know, cannabis hit the scene in the 1960s. Drugs hit the scene in the 1960s, you know. This was 1950s. People were smoking, smoking weed and, you know, taking acid. That was, that began in the 1960s. But Cannabis really found its home in the 60s as far as, you know, being used by a huge demographic of the population. It was embraced by young people. Um, it was embraced by cultural figures. And, you know, something I want to point out, too, is when I say young people, I mean, you know, politically active and motivated young people who are against the war. You know, we have the, the rise of counterculture, but really the anti-war movement. Um, and just its consumption alone was seen as a form of protest. I mean, these were kids whose parents grew up under the Harry Anslinger propaganda machine. These were the kids of parents who watched Reefer Madness. Um, so simply its consumption was seen as, you know, protesting and, you know, as the saying goes, sticking it to the man. Um, so, you know, it, the, the Marijuana Tax Act still made, um, you know, its production and movement federally illegal, but many states by this time, by the 60s, had on the books illegal criminalization for possession, um, and arrest rates, you know, began to skyrocket compared to the 50s. Like I said, its consumption um, was seen, it was widely more accepted in the 60s than it was in times prior. Then in 1969, the Supreme Court of the United States uh, strikes down the Marijuana Tax Act. And um, that was done because of a man named Timothy Leary. Timothy Leary was a Harvard professor um, who was taking a trip with his family down to Mexico. On the way back from that trip, he was crossing in his car from Mexico into Texas via land uh, border. And um, he, had, he had pot in his car. The authorities found it, they seized it, and he was arrested in violation of the Marijuana Tax Act. He didn't have the stamp. Nobody had the stamp. So, you know, 
he was arrested, and what his lawyers argued was that by adhering to the Marijuana Tax Stamp Act, he was in violation of Texas state law, which, vi which made it illegal to simply possess the plant. Now, his lawyers successfully argued that this violated his Fifth Amendment right uh, against self-incrimination. They took that case to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court agreed, and the Marijuana Tax Act was struck down. But in 1969, a man named President Nixon was in office, and he made it his, do his job to move quickly to pass new legislation. So in 1970, one year later, next slide please, we have the uh, Controlled Substance Act. Now, the Controlled Substance Act you know, is extremely important for a variety of reasons. Um, it put all narcotics in the United States into a scheduling system um, one through five, schedule one through schedule five. Schedule one um, was and is the most harsh criteria uh, category for narcotics that exists. It is said to have no uh, medical uses and have an extremely high uh, probability and likelihood of abuse and addiction. Joining marijuana in this category is heroin and LSD. Below it is cocaine and methamphetamine. Um, so, you know, the Controlled Substance Act put cannabis in this extremely high, um, and for lack of a better term, hard to reach category. I mean, this is why we have so little scientific research on the plant today and why we know so little about it. Because the process to begin a study on cannabis is about a 20 year process, and nobody has time for that. So what it, what it also did was it got rid of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics and various other narcotic policing agencies and consolidated those resources into the Drug Enforcement Agency, um, pumping you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars into this new narcotic uh, policing agency, uh, the likes of which we hadn't seen before. Um, now, interestingly enough, you know, the Controlled Substance Act was only supposed to have cannabis on the Schedule I criteria temporarily. And I say that because within the bill, there is something called the Schaefer Commission, which was created. Now, what the Schaefer Commission was said to do was it set up a study to, um, it set up a commission to study the societal impacts of cannabis, the real societal impacts of cannabis. You know, it was to, to set out and say, okay, was everything we have been being told for the last 35, 40 years, is it all true? And as I'm sure you can imagine, it came out and said, it's bogus. You know, we have been lied to. Um, cannabis is not a violence-inducing drug. Those who use it actually tend to be more mellow. It is, it is safer than alcohol. And, um, you know, it released a report that um, I believe was called something along the lines of like marijuana, a misunderstanding. Um, it recommended that we deschedule, decriminalize, and um, instead of imposing you know, felonies and misdemeanors for possession, that we put you know, civil infractures, um, like $100 fines for simple possession, things like that. Now, it is believed that when this report hit Nixon's desk, he crumbled it up and threw it away. He didn't even take the time to read it. The Controlled Substance Act was here to stay. Um, and it really started a new chapter in the war on drugs. But as a result of this and other factors, it did create um, a group called NORML, of which I am a part of. NORML stands for the National Organization of the Reform of Marijuana Laws, which was founded in 1970. Um, and we're gonna kind of talk about what they did in the early days, um, you know, upon the passage of the Controlled Substance Act. Next slide, please. <coughs> so, you know, advocacy efforts in the 1970s were hard. Um, if you supported federal legalization in 1970, you were joined by 12% of Americans. Um, you were kind of, if you were a card-carrying member of normal, which this ad here is trying to get you to become, um, you were kind of on the outskirts of society. I mean, this was not a, a typical everyday issue that people were talking about on their kitchen tables. Um, now, as a result of that, they faced poor funding. And as a result of that, they didn't win many cases in the early days. Um, but what they were able to do was kind of flip the agenda on itself and use the media in their advantage. Um, you know, whereas once we were seeing ads that, you know, depict the smokers of marijuana as, you know, the devil, we're now seeing ads that kind of point to the, the ridiculous discrepancies that exist in our tax, in our criminal code when it comes to narcotics. This reads, getting caught with this plant can turn your life upside down. 
totally true. You know, if you were found with any number of plants um, or just simple possession at the time, I mean, you're looking at a mandatory minimum of two to five years. Um, and this is a felony conviction that you would carry with you for the rest of your life. I mean, this is not something that goes away, as I'm sure we all know. Um, so, like I said, they were able to use the media to their advantage and create a narrative um, slowly. No, obviously not overnight. I mean, we're, this, this fight is still ongoing. Slowly create a narrative that, you know, this plant and the consumption of it should be normalized. Um, and as we see later, um, a power shift began to take place. You know, obviously it is a national organization, but there are a variety of state chapters. We are the Vermont state chapter. Um, there is a California state chapter, Illinois state chapter. Um, and as we're gonna see, you know, the progress really began in state legislators, in places like Albany, in places like Sacramento. Um, that is where the, you know, legalization efforts really were, you know, getting a lot of traction um, as opposed to Washington, D.C. Um, so next slide, please. So key states really begin to push back. Oh, please play. Oh, it's not gonna play. All right, well, this is like, a little video that is not playing, but I have it here. And it shows all the different states as they begin to change colors and they show you, you know, they begin to uh, be, um, go have medical markets, they begin to decriminalize. Um, so, you know, California was the first state to put forward pro-cannabis language, if you will, in 1996. Ironically, uh, they were the first language to put, they were the first state to put anti-cannabis language on the books in 1915. But um, in 1996, California passed Proposition 215. Cal uh, Proposition 215 was a voter initiative which passed and set up a, the nation's first medical marijuana system. So any qualifying patient um, with a doctor's prescription could go into a legal, state legal, medical marijuana dispensary, get cannabis for that qualifying condition, and go home and smoke it on their property. Um, you know, it, it set up a system which utilized California's vast, um, you know, outdoor growing uh, climate, also known as the Emerald Triangle, which is three counties in Northern California, um, which at the time was producing like more than half of all the pot smoked in the U.S. Um, and as I'm sure you can imagine, the federal government was going to have none of this. So the DEA under the Clinton and Bush administrations were going in and were arresting people simply for walking into a doctor's office and walking out of a dispensary. They were seizing doctor's medical licenses for prescribing cannabis, um, and they were using their powers of asset forfeiture to seize the properties of uh, medical marijuana dispensaries, legal grow cultivations, and the homes of people um, who were using it. And um, you know, this is actually where normal and other cannabis advocacy groups begin to see a lot of traction. They bring light to this issue, and they kind of show how ridiculous this all is, you know? I mean, these are people who are just enjoying a casual smoke, and it mellows them out. And we have the DEA going in with, you know, these insane weaponization, these big weapons and these big guns, and it, people are coming out with, like, a plant in their hand. And they were able to bring light to this issue and, like I said, you know, turn the media that was previously working against them in their favor. Um, and, you know, California really set the, set the stage and set the tone for what was to come. I mean, I have it here. I could be just show you this. You kind of see the, how the map begins to change color, right? Other states really begin to follow in California's footsteps, whether it be decriminalization efforts or whether it be uh, medical um, systems where, you know, it, the, this was a huge change from the status quo that had existed for, God, you know, nearly 100 years at the time. Well, a little bit less, but you get the idea. And then in 2012, we have the beautiful states of Colorado and Washington passing the United States' first recreational cannabis market, um, which allowed anybody 21 and over to go into a uh, medical marijuana retail establishment, not medical, you know, recreational uh, cannabis retail establishment and buy it simply for being over the age of 21. We now have 21 states in the District of Columbia, um, which allows such sales. And as of October 1st, 2021, 2022, the state of Vermont. Next slide, please. So, you know, kind of finishing off with where we are today, um, this Gallup um, started polling Americans on how they felt about legalization in 1969. Like I said, if you supported that, 
um, in the late 60s, early 70s, you were joined by 12% of Americans. Um, now, look at where we are today. Nearly 70% of Americans um, across party affiliations support the federal legalization of cannabis. For the first time, um, a slight, albeit slight majority, of self-identified conservatives support the federal legal legalization of marijuana. There are very few issues in our political discourse of which we, of which has this kind of broad public support. You know, we look at issues such as um, abortion rights, uh, gun control, even climate change that, you know, it really divides people upon party lines. Cannabis, a little bit, but doesn't really have that issue. I mean, it is widely supported among a majority of Americans. Um, so as a result of that and all the state revenue that the 21 states in D.C. are bringing in, other states are taking note. So, you know, where we are today is uh, in 2018, um, the Farm Bill passed. And essentially what the Farm Bill did was it allowed for the commercial uh, cultivation of hemp and as well as the interstate commerce of hemp and its products such as CBD to be moved across state lines. This was a big deal as previously um, this was illegal. Now, you know, the big acts that we have right now in Congress are the MORE Act. Now, what the MORE Act does is it, um, if it were to be passed, it would deschedule uh, and decriminalize uh, cannabis as well as put forward some expungement mem uh, measures for a variety of crimes. You know, I'm, some of you may be familiar with President Biden's recent expungement uh, measure. That expunged specifically um, federal marijuana possession charges. What it didn't do was expunge federal marijuana trafficking charges. There is a big difference. In 2021, something like 111 people were arrested for simple possession on the federal level. Over 1,000 people were arrested for, for trafficking on the federal level. So this was a simple drop in the bucket. Um, then we also have the Safe Banking Act. The Safe Banking Act would allow major banking institutions to retain their federal uh, depositors insurance should they decide to work with um, you know, legal cannabis establishments. Um, right now, they cannot do that. Chase, J.P. Morgan, Wells Fargo, um, you know, to say they can't do that, they would be at a huge risk of losing their FDIC insurance, which would send the whole thing belly up. Um, so this would give them protections to do that. <clears throat> and then we also have the Cannabis Administration and Opportunity Act, um, which is a, essentially um, the Senate version of the Moore Act. It was introduced by Senator Chuck Schumer, and it would decriminalize, deschedule cannabis on the federal level, as well as inject funds into already existing minority and veteran-owned businesses, uh, legal cannabis businesses. Um, and you know, it both all these bills have have a decent amount of traction. I know the Moore Act has passed out of the House numerous times. Um, have, be have people at this conference have said, um, but the Senate is a different beast. So that is really the big hurdle that federal uh, cannabis advocates are facing today. Speaking of federal cannabis advocates, um, you know, I think it's also really important to look at who are pushing for these bills right now um, in DC. So we have groups like Normal, National Organization for Marijuana Laws, who have been doing this since 1970. Um, we have groups like uh, MPP, the Marijuana Policy Project, who are fighting a similar fight, um, the Drug Policy Alliance, um, and a variety of other uh, groups, but then we have uh, there's a group called CPEER. Now, CPEER, I might get this wrong, but is the Coalition for Protection of Equity and Something Something Cannabis. A look at their website, you know, you'll see that they want federal legalization. They want, you know, responsible studies for cannabis. They want to see, you know, patients' rights preserved. One click of who their members are, their paid members include Philip Morris, include companies like Camel, uh, Cigarettes, Reynolds Association, which is a huge conglomerate. Um, and mind you, you're not, they're not going to say Philip Morris. It says Altria, which is this you know, shell company, if you will, this alternate name that is Philip Morris and these other big tobacco companies, as well as uh, Miller Coors, who comprises, I think, nearly 40% of the alcohol market. Um, and you know, other big money movers like Brinks, you, know, you see those armored trucks driving around. These are the people who are pumping money into, into the federal cannabis legalization space to push it their way. Um, you know, and it, it, it's, there's kind of this feeling that, oh, you know, federal legalization is on the horizon, the fight is over, you know, let's stop the funding, stop the donations. 
Now is when we really need to put money into these fights because we need to fight behemoths like this who are pushing the law in their favor. You know, it, Marlboro has already uh, trademarked the term Marlboro Greens. It's there. Like, they are looking at this and they are licking their chops for federal legalization. And once it's passed, they're going to answer that why question for us. Why did the federal government do it? Big business. So, you know, again, where we are today is we are constantly fighting to destigmatize uh, cannabis and fight for a fair and equitable market structure rollout. Um, you know, this is vitally important, and especially taking the political context of cannabis into account when we set up uh, legal markets, whether it be federal or statewide. You know, I always say, like, we're not selling tennis shoes over here. This is cannabis. This is, the, the, the history is, is, is in, like, just, it's so important to take into account when we think about these things. Um, they are racially discriminatory. They are anti-farmer. They are anti-small business. Um, and the, all these measures really are important when we set up our markets because, you know, once that first sale happens, it is so much harder to change the laws than if we do it beforehand. Um, so, you know, one of the hallmark issues of Vermont Normal, uh, we are trying to get a cannabis delivery license passed that would be available exclusively to social equity applicants uh, for a set period of time. You know, we really see that as a low barrier entry point to the market for someone who's been disproportionately impacted by the war on drugs. You don't need 20 years of cultivating experience to compete with some of the best growers in the world that we have here in Vermont. You don't need half a million dollars to set up a brick and mortar retail shop. Um, so that is you know, one of the main measures that we're trying to get passed. But all in all, this is just a very important issue to keep our eye on. You know, if there's one thing I want to send you home with, that it, the fight is not over. You know, federal legalization is coming. It is coming soon. Whether or not it is going to work for you know, folks like us in this room and out, you know, everyday Americans is yet to be determined. So thank you very much. Thank you, guys. And, uh Any questions? Be happy to answer them. I got one. Um, you mentioned Biden's pardon that was uh, incomplete, to say the least. The other part of that directive was ordering a review of the scheduling status. I'm wondering, uh, particularly what Jason was saying earlier, which I'd love to talk to you about, man. Uh, wondering if you have any insight or just thoughts on where that is going to go. Because again, he part of that was, oh, you're not familiar. He ordered the FDA to review the scheduling status of, of cannabis. And so what happened, and so the, or the DEA. So the DEA has now said that they've begun that review um, and there's a ticking clock. So they'll have to come up with some sort of decision before the end of his term. Any thoughts, insight? No. To be honest, I, I, I'm ashamed to say, but I am not totally familiar on that issue. But I think that it's vitally you know, important that we study this. You know, the fact that the DEA is doing it leads me to believe that we're going to have a repeat of what happened in 1972. We're going to get the report, regardless of what it says. It's going to get crumpled up and thrown out. Um, but you know, that is, I think, very interesting to look at. Um, and whatever, you know, whatever scientific information we can get, whether it's put forward by the federal government or whether it's put forward by an independent peer-studied review, is so important. We, have, we know so little about cannabis scientifically um, that, you know, really, as an advocate, we'll take whatever we can get at this point. Um, but thank you for bringing that up. On that issue, there was a story earlier in this week, because I think it's been already two months since this rescheduling, you know, analysis has been going on, and there's been no information released at all. Um, and so I think it was, it was some senators, a couple of Democratic senators, uh, sort of called on the DEA to say, "Hey, what's up? You know, uh, you said you're going to be transparent, and no information has been coming out." So that just kind of happened this past week. So I don't, there hasn't been a response, as far as I know. But you know, people are have their eye on that. Right. Yeah. You know. You know, on the federal level, we are seeing slowly more and more Republicans defecting from party lines, um, which is obviously a great sign, but that's mostly happening in the House of Representatives. Uh, like I said, the Senate is a completely different beast, and you know, we largely, largely have Newt Gingrich to think for that, but uh, you know, it's a story for a different day. Um, thanks very much. I, uh, just one final point on this. My appreciation is that the, the uh, initial directive is for uh, 
S to make the recommendation to the DEA, at which point the DEA releases a report, which means that e even if HHS says, as has happened many times throughout mm -hmm. history, mm -hmm. hey, it's actually time to be re rethinking right. this. There's no obligation on the DEA to adopt that, which essentially means President Biden punted the question right before a, an election while being able to announce that he was doing something on legalization, right? And so the timing of that, I think, is really even more important than the, um, than the content. Right. Um, I did have a completely unrelated question to you. I know Vermont Normal works quite a bit on this idea of um, delivery licenses specifically allocated to social equity applicants, which is not uh, a system that we have here now. I do believe that's a system that exists uh, in some other states or municipalities, and I'm curious if you can speak a bit more to what their successes or challenges may have been, both in creating those rules and also in implementation. I would be happy to. So the state of Massachusetts has such a program. Um, it is successful by the numbers. People are engaging with it. Businesses are engaging with it. You know, it is one thing for customers to do it. It's another thing for, you know, this, this industry is, in, is, you know, the supply chain, every player relies on everybody else insanely. The cultivators can't sell it. The retailers can't grow it. So there is a huge dependence on one another. So the delivery operators greatly have to rely on retailers setting up contracts with them and being able to work with them. Um, it is a different story in Colorado. So I believe in Colorado it is county-based, but that Denver, the, whatever county, that's Denver County, um, sits in also has a social equity exclusive delivery license. And we have talked with a gentleman who owns a business out there. He's a social equity applicant and he owns a delivery business out there. And he still faces a lot of racism and stigmatization of his business. Um, you know, someone pointed out, like, you know, I mean, there's cannabis businesses everywhere um, in Denver. And many of them are simply waiting for these timelines, these exclusivity periods to be lifted. And they are holding out of working with these social equity applicant businesses um, in the hopes that once, you know, once that exclusivity time period is over, they can come in. Um, with their much bigger fleets, with their much bigger staff, um, and that they, you know, can essentially take over the market. And it's, it's different because on one hand, you want to have measures that are in interest of business, and on the other hand, you want to have measures that are in interest of safety. So one of the things that the gentleman from Colorado pointed out to us is that, you know, he has to have two drivers in the car at all times. He can only move essentially one or two orders at a time. That doubles his gas costs, that doubles his labor costs, the insurance is like $1,000 a month. Um, and, you know, this is a man who had a cannabis conviction on his record. You know, th this is not someone who was born into wealth. These are very high business costs for anyone to face, uh, let alone this man. But, you know, the, like I said, it is happening in Massachusetts. It is working, but it really needs to be, you know, somewhat more enforced and also find that balance of, public safety for the drivers, which is vitally important, while also having, you know, valid small business measures, which, you know, you can find a nice equilibrium for. I had a question about uh, the 2018 Farm Bill mm -hmm. and those changes to hemp, hemp regulation, deregulation. Uh, did you, do you happen to know, like, what groups, you know, put, pushed that initiative forward? And if so, um, as I understand it, they amend that body of law, like, every five years. So they're probably, you know, busy right now mm -hmm. putting together another farm bill. So I'm just wondering if there are any other initiatives. Well, oh, and you, so you're curious. Forefront. Yeah. Uh, what other initiatives yeah, are at play are right now? Are they farmers? Are they business people? Or are they like... Right. Well, you know, I know for a fact that Normal was um, a big component of that. You know, they are um, the oldest and um, arguably the largest uh, federal cannabis advocacy group um, in the United States. Um, they, pushed, they pushed that forward. But there were also, there were a lot of small farmer entities that were pushing for that. I mean, this is both a, you know, cannabis issue um, as much as it is a small farmer issue. So it, it was very interesting. I don't know the names of them off the top of my head, but it was interesting seeing kind of an array of players come together to push this issue forward. You know, it's, it's different than simple, you know, decriminalization or uh, passing a recreational license. Um, this is allowing small-scale farmers to grow it and also apply for uh, federal uh, pilot programs, apply for grants with the U.S. Department of Agriculture. 
you know, one of the big things that anybody who touches the plant faces is lack of access to funds, federal funds, state funds, uh, city funds, just, you know, government grants that are available to anybody else, you can't really touch if you touch the plant. This bill changed that a lot um, and helped a lot of farmers out in a lot of ways. Thank you. Um, this question is more along the lines of like advocacy and public messaging. So Normal has done a lot of work in the desimmunization of marijuana use. Um, I guess just from my own, on my own social media and my own perception, I've been seeing more studies come out about like the neurological and memory effects of like long-term and like high cannabis use, particularly in young people. So like how do you think about incorporating that new science into your like ethical public messaging? I think it's a great question. Um, you know, Vermont Normal takes, and Normal in general, and nearly all advocacy groups take, a, take public health very seriously. Um, this is not something to be taken lightly um, by any means. But on you know, the one hand, we want a sensible recreational market rollout. And on the other hand, you know, we want the public health, especially of young people, uh, to be a priority. So you know, this is one of the reasons why um, the age you know, to buy cannabis is 21, like it is alcohol. Um, now, there are some measures in state, and I'm not saying we're in support of this, but to give you an example to speak to that, um, there are some measures to put some of the more highly concentrated products on the market, like dabs, concentrates, um, to make the legal age limit that for, to be 25, which is the year the brain finishes developing. Um, you know, these are some examples that some states are considering um, and is one of the reasons why Vermont you know, passed um, one of the, you know, the, the THC caps, which we are not for. We are, we are very much against the THC caps here in Vermont. Um, but, you know, as far as the public, you know, the health of young people, you know, technically speaking, anyone under 21 should not be smoking cannabis. Um, I'm not saying that doesn't happen. Um, but, you know, with, with the products that we have on the market, you know, it is true that this isn't your grandfather's pot. I mean, it has gotten much stronger um, and for the better. For many people, I mean, this you know, this has helped many patients overcome many of their um, you know, chronic pains and illnesses. Um, you know, but on the other hand, it is it is somewhat you know a, more available um, to people than it ever has been. So, you know, we take public health very seriously, especially among young people. Um, but like I said, at the same time, having a sensible recreational market rollout and kind of being able to balance those two things is very important. Yeah, so as SSDP, we work on student sensible use on all different drugs, including cannabis, but psychedelics and more stigmatized drugs. And we really have to engage our K through 12 education system to start to have real education and including education of parents. And I think that's the part that gets lost in a lot of the business and decrim parts is that we're not actually fleshing out exactly how we're going to educate folks in order to do this in a way that isn't abstinence-based, right? Up to this point, it's always been, you just shouldn't do it. If you do it, you're gonna get in trouble. But in the same ways that we teach folks, there's a difference between beer, wine, and liquor. There are you know, dosing amounts that should be doing it, because we wanna make sure as folks are doing it safely and reducing as much harm as humanly possible. And the only way we're gonna do that is to give honest drug education. But in just about every state, it's very limited how much they actually talk about it. And it will continue to be limited until the departments of education fund those programs, bring in new types of advocates, new types of teaching methods, right? And make sure that there's also peer-to-peer -peer education involved. A lot of times we bring in Many folks here are a little bit young to have gone through D.A.R.E. programs, right? But that was how they had structured it for a long time, and it was a terrible disaster, right? Because one, it wasn't honest education, but also the person that was giving the education was often a police officer, right? So it was like, do what I say or I'm going to lock you up, rather than I'm somebody that has struggled with cannabis use, this is what happened to me, this is how I was able to get it under control, and this is uh, resources that are available to you. And I think that sea change in approach of how we talk to young people is something that the folks in this room need to be doing, but also parents specifically, really they need their own education of how to be a parent that uses drugs, how to make sure it's inaccessible. And then there are lots of different policies around, for example, like potency of gummies or whether or not an edible needs to be single serve packaged, right? So you can get a bag of gummies or you can get a bag of gummies that each individual gummy has its own wrapper and it takes longer 
for folks to actually open those things. So there are lots of possible ways we could go about it, but as long as our school systems are still sort of of a dare mindset, we're gonna continue to see these problems. So I do think the K through 12 education system is the way to best address that, but we have not gotten there quite yet. Yeah, no, thank you for saying that. And to that end, you know, I wanna say this, you know, we know just say no does not work. We have tried and it has failed and it won't work ever. And you know, there is a mental health crisis happening among adolescent and young people in this country. Um, and many of them, you know, are turning to drugs, but drugs is not the problem. We need to attack the root causes of this crisis that is happening, whether it happens in school, at home. Um, you know, many of, you know, when, when we say public health, we're not talking about a DARE program here. We're talking about looking at why we are having, you know, record high suicide rates among young people in this country. Um, why they are turning to drugs at such a young age, but we can't solve the problem if we don't look at the root cause of it. So I thank you for that comment. If I could add to that, part of the interesting aspect of building this legislation in New Hampshire was we partnered with an organization called, or, or trying to partner with an organization called New Futures. They're a very community, educator, parent-focused uh, lobby group. And to bring them into the fold, they created a set of principles that we have been negotiating with to try and follow so that they could maybe not endorse legalization but not oppose it, be neutral. And one of them was to increase the budget for pre-cannabis sale education to educate parents and children about what it does, how, what it's used for, and it was surprising because the us on the industry were saying, this is gonna actually help us promote the industry, but we'll promote the industry by saying, yes, here's what is good about legal cannabis and here's how you should mind utilizing it. So to bring a, a sort of a prohibitionist group mm -hmm. to the center to endorse it was recognizing that they see what we see, which is there's an education problem and we actually added a million dollars to the legislative budget, you know, again, here I am in New Hampshire adding, you know, creating a $4.6 million appropriation from the state government just to create legalization. I, I'm, I'm surprised I'm not, you know, getting rocks thrown at me on my ride home as they cross back over. But that's what it takes to win groups together to build a coalition to try and pass legislation is addressing some of the societal needs that we have, which is the lack of education and the lack of clarity that it's a, you referenced it earlier in your presentation. It's a plant that we don't research, and it has a lot of, it has, does have some negative issues at time, but it also has a tremendous amount of positive issues that we're not focusing on. And by creating education or research, it actually helps people have a better understanding, a better acceptance. You know, just talk to your kids, man. It's not that hard. <laughs> it just, just tell them, just tell them, you know, you did it, we all know you did it. And it's like, if the more we stigmatize and the more we push it down, the more curious they become. And that is like, that's just how kids' brains are operated. So as long as you can have reasonable, sensible conversations with young people in this country, whether your kid, your cousin, whatever, niece, nephew, you know, it's, that's really the future. And we, we really want, you know, sensible drug education um, for, you know, our young people here in this country. So thank you, Tim. I think that's about all. I thank you all very much. Okay, everybody, we're gonna take a really fast break while we get the next panel set up because we have some people joining us online. Um, it's the last opportunity to enter in the raffle. We're doing three tickets for $5 and a, with the potential to win up to a $500 gift, which is a decarboxylator and or ver compost from Vermont Compost. Thank you.
I got the thumbs up. Fantastic. Once again, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jill Martin Diaz. My pronouns are they, them, and I'm very privileged to run the immigration program here at Vermont Long Graduate School. Pause, no, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, it's, it's really, really exciting to be here um, and be a part of the conversation. And I'm really, first of all, thankful to the Food and Ag Law Society for putting this event on and for bringing such an intersectional and equitable lens to the conversation and making space for the conversation that we're gonna have today. Um, as an immigration advocate, I take a special interest in this topic because of course, based on how the federal laws currently sit and how scheduling currently sits, everything that we've been talking about at this conference, cultivation, uh, processing, sale, use, is our, thing, our activities of immigration privilege, right? As long as marijuana continue, and cannabis continues to be a controlled substance federally, um, participation in the cannabis industry in any sense continues to trigger very serious and irreversible immigration consequences for people who are not US citizens. Um, and for that reason, I'm really interested to hear about cannabis rescheduling in the last couple of panels. And I'm really, really excited to hear what our panelists have to say today about issues of equity and advocacy and expungement in the cannabis industry. So without further ado, I will invite the panelists to introduce themselves. First, I would like to share uh, sincere apologies on behalf of Ms. Bodita Money, who unfortunately due to tech issues is unable to join us right now. So I'm very sorry, but I would like to quickly um, introduce her, read her bio for you, um, and invite you to reach out to her and her organization to learn more. So she is the founder of the National Diversity and Inclusion Cannabis Alliance, INDICA, and is a frequent speaker at cannabis-related events and conferences with a focus on social equity, social justice, economic empowerment, diversity in the cannabis field, and how to enter the cannabis industry. So, um, Bonita, we're sorry we couldn't have you join us, but thank you for setting aside the time. Um, next, I will invite Jessica to please introduce herself. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Um, my name is Jessica Velasquez. I'm a CPA. I've been practicing 20 years um, and have focused in cannabis uh, for the last seven, I'm based out of Las Vegas. And so we've seen a lot of the initial uh, mature markets go live and really excited to see what the East Coast is gonna bring as we uh, legalize on that coast. Thanks, Jessica. And to Mairead. Yeah, good morning, everyone. My name is Mairead O'Reilly. I am the uh, resident public defender that everyone should have on their panel. Not that I should be on the panel, but a public defender. Um, so my perspective on the expungement uh, issue comes from my experience at Legal Aid um, in Vermont, where for uh, five or so years, I helped lead efforts to establish um, statewide expungement clinics um, and to lobby for um, you know, more accessible and, and universal uh, expungement laws. So very happy to be here. Thanks, Marie. And last but not least, Jesse, please introduce yourself. Hi, so I am Jesse J. McFarlane. I'm the co-founder and co-owner of Old Growth Vermont. It's a tier two licensed outdoor cultivation in Brownsville at the base of Mount Scutney. Um, and I am a social equity applicant or a license holder now. My father, my biological father was sentenced to 11 years in prison for, I think it was just under three quarters of a pound in Illinois. Um, so I was lucky enough, thanks to Nicholas with Normal, to have gotten a social equity um, license because of that. Um, so I think that's really kind of what got me on this panel, which I'm happy to talk about, but I also think I'm here because I talk to a lot of people in the community. I network a lot, and I think that's really important for our community and really important to advocacy and to social equity because communication is key. Um, so I'm really happy to discuss a little bit if you guys are interested in my biological father and how that's impacted me and 
him and the industry as a whole, but also I'd really like to speak about the culture today of the legacy market, which used to be called the black market, and the regulated world and how we can integrate those two things. Um, so yes, thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Jesse. Um, so just a little bit of housekeeping. I, the joy of moderating means I get to ask the first questions. Um, and then once I am satisfied, I will um, welcome, open up the floor and, and strongly welcome and encourage your questions, your comments, your participation. Um, we started a little late, so I hope people don't mind that we go a little late. Is that cool? OK, we're doing it. So um, you know, without uh, further ado, my first question is um, really directed at Jessica. Um, I'd be grateful if you could share with the room what some of the unique barriers to market entry are that are experienced by minority cannabis business owners, and what ameliorations does the Minority Cannabis Business Association recommend? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think we're all really familiar that um, there's social injustices in our financial system that impact people of color, um, regardless of whether they're in cannabis or not. And so I think really starting from the systemic issues that we've had uh, in financial services, um, particularly again, black and brown businesses, uh, being able to have access to loans um, and true financial capital, uh, you know, are, are kind of the starting point, right, for us here. Uh, and now we layer in cannabis. Uh, that is, as I'm sure you've covered today, Schedule One drug. And because of that, um, financial institutions are not able to lend, uh, bank, uh, and and provide services uh, to to the industry. Uh, over the last few years, we've certainly seen more credit unions and state-run banks open up their doors uh, to the industry, uh, but we're still way behind in terms of overall access. And so I think as we bring this conversation back to access for black and brown folks uh, and entrepreneurs that are looking to make their, their way into the industry, um, you know, they're challenged by this. Uh, lack of access to capital has always been an issue for our communities. And so um, I would say that this is probably one of the largest barriers to entry. Um, and, and the reason it is, is because it's very capital intensive to run an, a cannabis business, um, particularly in limited market license states uh, where it can cost you know, in the millions, really, to get a legitimate cannabis operation going. Um, so I think lack of access to capital, uh, even now in the private market, um, you know, is, is very challenging. And so I would say that that's definitely one of the barriers. Um, another that I see often, uh, particularly in my line of work, is uh, lack of, of act or acumen to, to business operations. Uh, a lot of our legacy operators that are looking to come into the now regulated market um, know their areas of expertise. You know, they might be really great uh, cultivators, uh, processors, they're great at distribution and selling because this is what they've been doing for so long. Um, but they really lack access or, or knowledge, I should say, of you know, how to run a successful uh, cannabis operation. Um, how do you become a market leader within your state, uh, given all of the regulations that cannabis brings to an operation? Um, you know, from my vantage point, I always say uh, to, to know where you're going, you got to know where you're coming from. And a lot of that stems in, in terms of financials. Um, I find that a lot of uh, minority operators don't really understand, um, you know, how to read financials and, and how to, uh, you know, use them to then operate their business and, and pivot course uh, if they need to. Um, so again, I, I would say that those are probably the biggest uh, barriers that I see from our 
uh, black and brown communities uh, looking to, to be successful in this industry. Uh, you mentioned the Minority Cannabis Business Association, uh, which I serve as treasurer for the organization and uh, some of the programming that we put on uh, helps provide some of these tools uh, to operators as well as different access and networking points so that folks have a, um, you know, more tools uh, on their tool belt uh, to compete in the marketplace. And can you tell us a little bit about um, how you got involved in that organization and then took on leadership at a national level? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I am the organization's first treasurer. Um, again, I, they, and, and the organization, I think, was really uh, rooted in terms of providing as much tools and knowledge to minority business owners and uh, had a gap in, in their financial uh, position as well. And um, I've been a big proponent of supporting minorities, women, uh, really over the lifetime of my career uh, and have been a huge uh, a proponent of the plant um, uh, as a consumer and uh, coming from the south side of Chicago, where I saw the war on drugs really impact my community in, in a negative way. Uh, I really wanted to make my mark and help change this industry uh, and make a pathway to legitimate and uh, legal business operations for everybody here. So I've been uh, really grateful for this opportunity to not just share my story, but uh, share as much of my knowledge as I can uh, to help uh, those business owners be successful. Thank you very much, Jessica. Um, turning to Maraid, I'm curious in um, situating this discussion right here in Vermont. Um, you have been a champion of expanding expungement laws here in Vermont. and. Um, since moving from civil legal practice into public defense, I'm curious if you could share with us a little bit about what sparked your passion as an attorney to look to expungement work and um, cannabis legalization advocacy. Oh, just a minute. I think you are muted, my friend. Oh, sorry. I can hear you. I'm trying to be polite. Um, <laughs> When I started at Legal Aid, um, I was tasked with um, this fellowship to um, work on the opioid crisis. Um, and so what I learned really quickly in working with um, a population that was either struggling with substance use disorder or had overcome substance use disorder is um, the almost everyone was uh, continued to struggle with accessing um, main, the mainstream, mainstream economy in some way. Um, and I was really seeing a lot of, um, barriers to, um, economic freedom, frankly, um, that were put in place by criminal records, um, that seemed to be a common denominator and it, and it became my focus, right? At Legal Aid, it, uh, the organization is focused on anti-poverty and how better to lift people out of poverty than to remove the barriers that are specifically keeping them in poverty. Um, and criminal records, um, you know, both for drug offenses, marijuana and others, um, and sort of drug adjacent offenses um, are so routine um, in Vermont and across the country. One in three people has a criminal record um, and you know studies continue to show that the folks who are unemployed um, even in you know 2022 studies are still suggesting that um, you know most at least half of those people who are in the uh, ranks of unemployed have criminal records so it's really about economic justice it's really about um, you know at some point, um, being committed to reintegrating, you know, whatever you think of the war on drugs, and I think a lot of us, you know, believe it's just completely wrongheaded. But um, you know, if a person has already completed their sentence, at some point, the punishment needs to stop, um, and that was really the focus of our work at Legal Aid was how can we systematize efforts so that this punishment stops for our people. 
Um, so yeah, that's that that was sort of uh, the entry to my interest. And then obviously, you know, fighting for people who are uh, currently being charged um, has, you know, it sort of led into that passion pretty naturally. Thanks, Maureen. Um, and Jesse, you very generously um, shared some of your personal experiences, so thank you, um, and your family's involvement with the criminal legal system. So I'm wondering if you could share a little bit more about what your lived experience has been entering the Vermont cannabis market, particularly as a social equity applicant. To put the focus just on as a social equity applicant, but I, I will touch upon it. Um, it's difficult because the market is still being created. Um, so, so far it's been really helpful in that it prioritized our license, which was incredible because we're outdoor growers. So we needed to get our plants in the ground. Um, so that was really helpful. I think they can go a little bit further at some point with it in prioritizing like product registration or test results. Um, and that's all in due time. I'd like to speak to the legal framework in our experience with that, yeah. if that's okay. Um, I'm sure this room would love to hear that. Yeah, so I was thinking, I was like, what has our experience been? I was like, I should go with a bedtime bun on top of my head so they can see all of my under hairs, <laughs> which are white. So white, and it has to do with <laughs> cannabis law. <laughs> you know, but then I hear people talk from New Hampshire and Connecticut, and it's like, okay, that's not been our experience at all. Um, so I will say the state of Vermont, the legislators and the CCB have done a really good job in comparison to other states. Um, however, I don't want that to be our bar. You know, because, I mean, you just heard what Connecticut was like. It's like, oh, $3 million for a license. Like, that is not a bar. Um, so what I'm finding is, needs to be addressed, and especially for people that are minorities and people that have been in the legacy market, social equity or not, because you can't be a social equity applicant if you weren't charged. So my husband was in the legacy market since he was 16. Um, and he was never charged because he was extremely deliberate about how he approached it. Um, but he has incredible PTSD. I mean, it is like, it is a ridiculous, um, I shouldn't say ridiculous, it's really trying as a wife in this market, having my grower that came from the legacy market put himself out there and kind of deal with the consequences of what that looks like. So with our market, I feel like what is most important, if we want the Vermont market to look like craft, like it already is, and we want it to look like minority owners and women and social equity and to bring in the legacy market, then what we really need to keep at the forefront is how to integrate these two cultures. So on one hand, the culture of the legacy market, which is very much rooted in a resistance to authority, um, these kind of underground networks um, and the importance to community. And then on the other hand, the culture of regulated society, which is uh, based in discipline, um, you know, following the rules or having a respect for the rules because seeing the importance of them, um, business and profit, you know, and just integrating these two things. Um, there has been a lot of, even within, you know, the law aside, but dealing with the relationships within the regulated market, um, there's a lot of different resentments that pop up because you have this layer of mistrust of recognizing that we all, as we've heard today, especially from Nick, is like we've been BS about cannabis for the better part of a century. And those of us that have been working with cannabis in the legacy market for decades now are seeing people come on board that all of a sudden want to be a part of it. And it's easy, especially looking to other states, to be like, wait, are people wanting to be a part of it because of the profit? And in some cases, yes, that's true. But in other cases, it's not. You know, it's because people are coming on board because now it's okay to. 
you know, and I feel like, oh gosh, how long have I talked? <laughs> I feel like the key to this integration is communication, just continuing to talk to one another and addressing resentments. Um, and I feel like the best way to address resentments or prejudice is starts within, within our own hearts. It's like if a resentment pops up and you, we feel like, oh, the CCB is, it's a conspiratorial and they're trying to support MSOs and they're giving them a free pass, then I have to pause and be like, okay, Jesse, what fear am I experiencing right now? And what, what is this rooted in? Because the alternative of going down the bottomless pit of resentment is that it's bottomless. <laughs> You know, so I think addressing those two things, resentment, communication, then we can find a way to integrate these two cultures and then create a sustainable market and then address the fact that we want to purchase craft and keep it within the state and these important things that maybe aren't important to you, but I think they should be. <laughs> Thanks, Jesse. I won't ask it, but I will suggest to any of the Masters of Restorative Justice students in the room that it sounds to me like there might be some restorative principles that might need to be brought to this community. So just going to flag that. Um, and then my last question kind of for the group, and I'll let you folks kind of jump in. Um, you know, you have a captive audience of future lawyers and current lawyers and legal advocates and lawmakers. Um, and so I'll ask you panelists to please think about times when you, I mean, and Jesse touched on this a little bit, have wanted or sought legal help or provided legal help um, to address issues of inequity in the cannabis industry. And um, I'm curious to hear you respond to, you know, what role do lawyers and future lawyers and advocates and future advocates have to play in making the cannabis industry, this new market, more equitable? I'm happy to jump in here Thanks, on this one. Yeah, um, you know, for for those folks out there that are not familiar with tax law and, and how it um, affects the current industry and its current status, uh, there's a code section called 280E uh, that negatively impacts the industry. Um, essentially, uh, cannabis businesses are taxed at uh, the gross profit level versus the net income level, like every other business uh, it, that follows uh, U.S. tax law. And so until we see federal legalization or some sort of descheduling where cannabis is no longer a Schedule One and 280E does not uh, apply to it, uh, we're going to see negative impacts uh, on these businesses um, from here to then. And so for me, uh, I'd love to have a new wave of, of lawyers really uh, fighting the, the good fight uh, on Capitol Hill with respect to uh, 280E or federal legalization, either one of those, uh, because it is detrimental to the industry and even more detrimental to businesses of color. Again, we're disproportionately impacted um, in general in terms of business and in finance and so uh, this particular barrier makes it extremely difficult for businesses uh, to thrive uh, and and really be uh, players in in this ongoing business uh, no jessica are you still with us yes i'm still here Sorry. If you could please repeat your last sentence, we missed it. Sure. Uh, I was uh, saying that um, for what I've seen in the last few years is uh, minorities um, are, are really kind of selling their licenses uh, because they can no longer truly compete with some of the larger players in the marketplace. Um, and it's my opinion that 280E has a huge impact on that uh, because it impacts cash flow and, and, and really, again, how you're running your business on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, again, code section 280E for, for those folks that are uh, interested in, 
and looking to learn some more on the financial side. Awesome, thank you. I see that we have our first audience question, but first I just wanna check in with Marie and Jesse and see if you had any thoughts that came to mind in response to this question of the role of lawyers and lawmakers and advocates. Uh, buy from small cultivators. <laughs> 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 Marie? So my perspective is, um, you know, so limited and you know, my experience with the cannabis industry is so limited. But I will say that um, I, I think generally in order to empower community members to have, you know, a slice of any pie um, in terms of, you know, formalizing business, um, really just continuing um, students, student attorneys, future lawyers, um, have a role in continuing the work of making record clearance um, the default, right? And so part of what Vermont did so successfully, I think, is pass a law to automatically expunge the, you know, minor misdemeanor possession convictions. Um, and that, you know, that went through and that's great, but there's so much more work to be done so that um, folks who have been, you um, you know, disproportionately impacted by the war on drugs can actually be brought back into the fold. Um, I think, you know, part of the other successes um, that have occurred in Vermont um, have been sort of to um, <clears throat> to pass legislation that ensures, um, you know, there are fewer financial barriers to filing for expungement. But I think ultimately it's really about, you know, making making automated um, expungement the default um, here in the state. Um, and until that happens, um, you know, using your student uh, power to organize clinics, you know, go into communities and, and, and give the thing that um, community members are asking for, which is help clearing their records so they can finally be free. Um, I think the law school has a great history of partnering with legal aid and the attorney general's office. Um, and I, I, I learned that I think the law school received some significant funding from the federal government around reentry um, work. And so I would hope that that some of that goes to expungement um, and, you know, helping folks reintegrate in that way. But there's so much work to be done. I think there's a great template in Vermont um, and the work needs to be picked back, picked back up. So I hope that happens. Thanks, Marie. Um, I can't say much now, but we did, and we will. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, so we'll go to our first audience question. Thank you so much. Um, I just, uh, when Jessica was talking about 280E, I can't help but uh, react. Um, I work at a, a national law firm, Greenspoon Martyr. We're well known as 280E experts. And uh, Jessica, I, I have good news. And for anybody that's operating retail in this store or in this room, come find me. Um, there is a new section of the tax code that was created under the Trump tax cuts in 2017 called 471C, which is a small business exemption for any small business, uh, small being under $27 million in revenue on a three-year uh, average basis that uh, basically allows for all uh, cost of goods sold to be deducted. Um, so I'd be happy to go into more detail offline with you, Jessica, and share and connect you with my colleague, Nick Richards, who's been pioneering this stuff. We're gonna have an article uh, put out in the next week or two that'll be titled Relief for the Cannabis Industry, R-E-L-E-A-F, you know, a little punny. Um, but yeah, you're a thousand percent correct that 280E has been actually, I would say, the number one driver in making the industry not profitable. Um, and that this 471C exemption is a big, big deal because I would say 95% or so of cannabis operators are under that $27 million threshold. Um, the other good news associated with this, y'all, is that with the same logic, we're advising people to capitalize their past 280E costs, um, which can be useful for ongoing tax obligations or if you're going to go into M&A and make an exit, it can be very useful in raising your valuation. Um, and then there are some other things that we can do around basis um, for those businesses that are over that $27 million threshold. So you're certainly correct in that 280E has been a massive barrier and problem for the industry, but there is actually some relief along the way or coming on, uh, down the pipe. Um, we've, and just to be clear, we've had several audits go through now where we've used the 471C method and have had multiple no changes from the IRS. So we're seeing no problem there. 
We've also seen the Treasury Inspector General, which oversees the IRS and audits IRS programs, specifically note 471C as a, a better accounting method for marijuana companies in their 2020 audit of 280E. So really exciting stuff is happening. I will say to you law students that are looking for a pathway into cannabis, tax law is actually one of the really exciting things in the cannabis industry. Um, so if you want to be a cannabis lawyer, be a fucking tax lawyer. <laughs> So funny, as an immigration person, I was always told, if you're interested in the federal administrative dog's breakfast that is immigration law, you would be interested in tax, but I'm telling you, like, I have a block. I can't believe they let me be a law professor and I, like, can't follow numbers. <laughs> so I appreciate you being in this room and bringing that perspective. Um, it's, <laughs> yeah, th no, thank you, thank you. So you've broken the ice for us. Now, audience, yes. Hi. Um, so I had a question. Um, immigrants, both documented and undocumented, are minorities in our community that are often forgotten about, but were disproportionately affected by the prohibition of cannabis. These current benefits of cannabis legalizations are not often are not felt at all by immigrants because of immigration policies of the federal government. Is there a move towards or a way that immigrants, both documented and undocumented, are able to participate in advocacy and receive the actual real benefits of expungement since during the immigration process, often expunged records can still be used? What a great question. Um, so I can give a little bit of context to what the immigration law says about um, what is a conviction or what kinds of cannabis related activity could trigger immigration consequences. Um, and then if I may pass it to Mairead to talk a little bit about um, how you have um, worked to um, provide access to expungement and sealing to non-citizen folks or you know, what you do in those cases where someone is not a citizen. So under the Immigration and Nationality Act, um, there are a few areas where cannabis-related activities might come into play, right? Um, if a person has permanent residency, for example, and they are seeking to naturalize, they want to apply to become a citizen, then one of the things that they must show is that they meet good moral character, which is a term of art defined by the INA. Um, because marijuana is scheduled, any marijuana-related activity is not good moral character. And so what you have to do, I mean, it's a balancing test typically. Um, so when a person is proving their good moral character, whether for citizenship or for other forms of immigration relief or status, they want to be able to show that there are enough positive equities to outweigh any, anything that could give rise to a negative inference that the person lacks good moral character. A lot of double negatives in the immigration statute. Um, another very two important areas where cannabis-related activities could come into play, INA 212, which is the statute on inadmissibility, and INA 237, which is the statute on deportability. So these are, um, these are questions of removability, exclusion, that come up for people at all um, corners of the immigration status spectrum. So for folks who have entered without inspection and do not have status, for folks who have a kind of a temporary or time sensitive status, for folks who have lawful permanent residency, which is a very misleading name because it is not in fact permanent because if you have marijuana related activity in your background, you can lose your lawful permanent residency. Um, and that's what those two sections of the statute 212 and 237 say. Um, one of the ways sometimes these immigration consequences are triggered by a conviction as defined by the Immigration Nationality Act. Sometimes just reason to believe that you have been involved in these cannabis activities is enough to trigger certain immigration consequences. And that reason to believe is in the eye of the immigration officer, meaning right, not the head of the Department of Homeland Security, but many, 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 many levels of bureaucracy down, the frontline Customs and Border Protection or Immigration Customs Enforcement person or CIS person who's engaging with the applicant. A conviction for immigration purposes typically requires an admission of guilt or wrongdoing or the conduct or a formal judgment of guilt or the wrongdoing of the conduct plus um, some kind of punishment. 
the punishment that we often think about when we're talking about um, like harm reduction approaches to criminal legal work, so you know, alternative sentencing and treatment court and expungement and record and sealing, a, a lot of that stuff we think, oh, you know, time served in jail or, or prison is the punishment. And so sometimes you know, a person might come to you and say, I have this arrest, but I didn't go to jail. Red flag, for immigration purposes, that person might still have a conviction for immigration purposes, even if they later, you know, they had alternative sentencing, they completed a treatment program, and then had, um, you know, the charges dropped. They may nevertheless be convicted for immigration purposes. So that's the kind of quick, I mean, in my immigration law seminar, we're about to spend like actually seven classes on all of that, so, but okay, but you know, the, the, the 10 second, the 10 cent tour. So with all of that context, Maraid, um, and I know, I used to work at Vermont Legal Aid with Maraid, so I'm, this is, a, I'm throwing her softball. So um, when we come across um, a non-citizen who is asking us for legal help with expungement or sealing, what happens? What do you do? We refer them to people like Jill Martin Diaz. Um, <laughs> Or, so or I mean, th th there's there's attorneys, um, you know, who work at the central office of the Defender General who do sort of the intersection of, of criminal law and immigration. And, you know, they're always um, the people to take a look at these cases before we even venture to try to help because we could be doing more harm by actually expunging the record um, because there could be information within that record that's actually quite helpful that could prevent deportation from occurring. So it's basically don't touch anything until an immigration expert has um, given you the go ahead. But there definitely have been circumstances where um, a foreign born but US citizen uh, needs help with expunging the record. And, you know, we get the green light because they they have citizenship and and um, there is no longer the risk that they're going to lose that in the case of expungement. Um, but yeah, it's, it's certainly a tricky area of law. And, and Jill knows a lot more about it than I do. Well, that was my attempt to share the mic. But now I'll talk again. Um, just one more thought on that. So the other thing to think about that Marie's talking about is like getting the green light to go ahead and pursue expungement or sealing. Sometimes a person has cannabis related activity, maybe a conviction on their record or something that is a conviction and is a criminal history. However, it might not be of the kind that triggers immigration consequences. You nevertheless have to disclose it all when you're applying for immigration benefits or invoking uh, protection from deportation. And so the, the way to prove that you have a record but that the record isn't immigration consequential is to provide copies, right? Certified copies from the court. And here's the problem for non-citizens, uh, especially if let's say you're going to, like you don't know what your future immigrate, you know, your immigration future might look like. Once you have expunged your record, it doesn't exist. And so later on, if you go to naturalize, let's say, and they're like, uh, you were arrested and you have to say, yes, I was, but now you can't show what for. So have you accidentally created um, a reasonable inference of something worse that would be immigration consequential, right? So super, super tricky stuff for non-citizens. The short answer to your question about like how are non-citizens kind of being brought along this equity journey, I mean, I, don't, I'm not involved in this work, like in the cannabis immigration intersection, so I don't want to say that yes or no. And maybe Jessica can speak to the kind of financial pieces of it. Um, but what I can say from my vantage point is it's super exciting to hear that there are opportunities in tax law and in um, the federal schedule of controlled substances to make changes that would minimize immigration consequences for non citizens because. I'm not holding my breath for immigration reform. And Jessica, I don't know if you have something to share about that from like the financial point of view or the, the small business point of view. Um, not, not so much. Uh, again, I think the financial aspect really impacts every licensed uh, operator currently in the industry, whether they're um, facing immigration issues or not. Um, so. But, but really great points. Yeah, thanks. Other questions, thoughts? And then we'll get to you in the back next. 
Yeah, um, my question was about the social equity applicants and what that looks like to be categorized in that field, in that, um, in that sector, and then what kind of benefits you receive and just how that process has been going, because it still seems relatively new. So I don't know what it was for where they landed with everyone else. Um, I'm pretty sure it was, and Nick will be able to answer this, I'm sure, but populations that were disproportionately affected by cannabis prohibition. Um, if you were, had a cannabis charge or an immediate family member had a charge. And then, is there another one? I feel like there's a third. And no residency requirement. With any of those. Um, so for me, obviously, it was the immediate family member, even though I've been involved with cannabis since I was 14, but my biological father's imprisonment um, is what got us a social equity status. And then what they've done for social equity applicants was the prioritizing of licenses. Mm -hmm. And then also they started social networking events, mm -hmm. but those really didn't turn into social equity networking events. They turned into like Zoom calls for the in, for open to the public for everyone. Sometimes ones in which you couldn't engage in comments. Uh, they would only allow you to ask a question um, and it was open to anyone, but it was called a social equity event. Um, so those, that kind of didn't happen. And then they hired an out-of-state consultation firm to help social equity applicants, uh, which has been really helpful. Like I used mine to help me learn bookkeeping. Um, and that was extremely helpful. I still have some hours that I could use with that, that you know, I could do with websites or logo or you know, whatever um, is a need to fill there. And then they said that there is, there, I put in an application for some funding that could come our way up to $5,000. So we'll see if that happens or not. Um, I think like with the social equity events, I just wanna point out, I don't think that was intentional that it didn't end up being for social equity applicants or anything to really do with it. Um, the CCB is extremely overworked and understaffed and they don't have the capacity for a lot right now. Um, and the biggest thing that could help not only social equity applicants, but the community as a whole would be for legislators to start, start supporting the CCB in a real way and to give them more funding and more staffing. Um, and did you ask anything else about it? Oh, I thought were, so to, to increase access to social equity applicants, is there also reducing fees for oh, yeah. licensing? Yeah, that is, was a good one that I have benefited from, that was glorious, <laughs> is the licensing fee was waived, um, which was incredibly helpful to us. I think it would have been, the reason why I'm hesitant on this is because it changed so often, all of these details uh, were really, the CCB and the community were building the plane as we fly it. So I feel like the tier two licensing ended up at $2,500. Uh, so that got waived for us. Um, and, and we are, like that's also a really important note to, um, to something to make note of is the fact that we are all building the plane as we fly it. So something will pop up in the media and you'll be like, how could this be? What have they done? You know, but it's like we are all, all of us from the CCB down to the growers are at our capacity. Um, it is extremely difficult to build this industry from nothing with all of the cultural differences that we have while it's federally illegal, while we have to bootleg the entire thing because we don't have access to capital. You know, don't have access to, grunt, uh, to grants in case it's federally funded, in case there's some cash flow somewhere that is connected to the federal government, you know? So, do I just go on a rampage again? <laughs> No, that's fantastic. And um, I just want to give Jessica the opportunity to chime in on the subject. Um, since your organization had an amazing comparative social equity report, so says my amazing colleague, Professor Varadi. Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, I was uh, wanting to jump in on this one too. Um, so MCBA has been around since 2015. Uh, I wanna say we are the first uh, 
organization that's really uh, led the way in, in terms of uh, providing social equity, um, uh, you know, frameworks really for, for what we now see in various states that have adopted social equity uh, licensing provisions. And so, um, as, as the saying goes, uh, you gotta, you gotta kind of ride the bike first and see how, how that feels and uh, how it then progresses for you to, to get better. And so we've seen um, as we move East Coast uh, that states that are adopting these social equity programs have uh, really changed and, and gone better in, in terms of what uh, benefits are really given to social equity applicants. Um, what we saw, I think, really early on was these social equity programs that weren't really built all the way to support uh, the, the applicants coming into the program. Um, there was, you know, initially no waiver of fees. There was no funding for these applicants. There was no uh, what I call kind of wraparound services. And now we're seeing a lot of the, the newer markets, again, that are adopting these programs really take those issues uh, front and center and deal with them. Uh, because it's one thing to hand over a license, and then it's a whole nother thing to actually operate it and, and again, be successful uh, with your uh, competitors within your state. So uh, I'm happy to hear about all of these benefits that Vermont is bringing to this group of folks to make them uh, that much more successful in, in the marketplace. Thank you. Um, I see the time is a little after 12.05, um, but I hope if the panelists and audience will indulge us. I saw one more question in the back. I don't know, who has the mic? Oh. <laughs> I didn't mean you to can fight it out. <laughs> well, just really quickly, I just wanted to add to the uh, discussion, the comments <laughs> on uh, uh, support from um, the uh, Vermont Cannabis Control Board. After several months of discussions with those folks, uh, our program at Castle University, the Cannabis Study Certificate Program, uh, has uh, been, we're going to be offering uh, courses to social equity applicants and being paid by the uh, Agency of Commerce Community Development, particularly for uh, business uh, um, skills and, and training. What the CCB has discovered is that a lot of the applicants coming through, many of them, someone said this early, many of them have a lot of skills in cultivation, but not a lot in, in business. Uh, so beginning with our can of business course, taught right here by, by Tim Egan, uh, beginning this summer, um, we're gonna, that course is gonna be offered to students uh, um, who get social equity app, um, licenses. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, I wanted to explicitly ask the RJ question that was alluded to. <laughs> um, and I think in general, like a lot of people when they think of RJ in terms of the cannabis industry is in, um, you know, restorative justice when someone is arrested for possession or use of cannabis. But I've never really thought about um, the use of restorative justice in the cannabis policy. Um, and I would love to hear uh, your perspective on how cannabis um, restorative justice could be used to um, help bridge that um, community social uh, issue that you're alluding to in terms of um, the legacy growers and the industry as it is now. Yeah, so, I mean, and Jesse, I think this one's, you know, kind of directed yeah, at yeah. you and Marie too, because I know you're working in the defense system, but are you, as someone, I've, I'm layman's level of RJ because I just started taking my first RJ course. Um, so. I guess when I was hearing you speak and thinking about Marie's work as well, thinking about what a restorative approach to engaging with, um, to bringing those two spheres of people together, kind of the legacy market and regulated, the regulated market. Um, and you were talking about a lot of the repair that has to be done for past harms. Yeah. Um, so not to single you out, anyone can jump in, but just, I mean, how, do, how does that sound to you? Like, is that sound like a feasible, would you be, are you game? <laughs> well, I need to know more about, I mean, restorative justice, I know, generally speaking, what that might encompass, but why don't I let Marriott go first if she has something to offer so I can get more feel from your guys' language of what you mean by that and how I think 
it could be, be implemented in the community. Yeah. So I sort of had the same exact um, thought and probably do have the same sort of level of knowledge on the restorative side, just because, I mean, while I, I get to refer people and, and help divert them out of the criminal legal system into restorative justice, my only real experience there is, is volunteering on panels. But similarly, what I, um, I echo Jill's response that when, when you were speaking about um, the sort of rift um, and the conflict and the resentment that was building up, my thought was like, wow, a dialogue, a facilitated restorative dialogue um, that's like a systematic you know, conversation between these parties would actually be brilliant. It would be very Vermonty. It would be very like it would sort of fit. It would fit the whole ethos that like Vermont sort of runs with. It's it's totally feasible. Um, it's not expensive, but I completely agree. And I think your perspective about you know the resentment. It, you were talking just sort of a lot about like the emotional side of things, which I think the law and the business sectors don't deal well with. Um, but to actually bring the restorative professionals into the room to have that conversation, I think could actually like shift things in a really important way. I mean, if we believe in it so much for um, the criminal legal system, you know, on the sort of smaller individual scale, um, I think also sort of using this space to 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 bring that restorative work. Um, yeah, it just it makes so much sense. So I don't know if that helps you sort of understand what exactly we're talking about in terms of restorative justice, but it's just that facilitated dialogue that really allows harm parties to, you know, essentially be, um, you know, sort of like the system actors to, to, to atone for um, the wrongs that were done and, and for the harm parties to really uh, articulate what the harm was and, and to work through that. Um, I think that could happen. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, that, that sounds like a fabulous idea. It's like in our generation now, we're recognizing that things like long dialogue is actually people are really hungry for it. Whereas before we thought that these like quick news clips or is all we had the attention span for. And we're finding that's actually not the case at all, that people really do wanna hear just two people having a conversation. So that's a fabulous idea is maybe that's a way that we could address that. Uh, because I don't, I don't see another way forward of having a really healthy market uh, because the alternative to not having these discussions and not becoming a community and becoming local and recognizing the individual level is that corporate cannabis will come in and they will take over and that'll be the end of it until we wake up and decide differently and then it'll be a, a bit of a backpedal. I think if there's any state that has a chance of making this market sustainable and to having social equity applicants, minorities, and people in the legacy market involved, it is Vermont. Um, and the work is now, which is really hard for us in the community because like I said, we're already at our capacity on both ends. Um, but we have to push ourselves to continue to work through this right now, otherwise it's not going to happen. And we're not at our best because we're at our capacity. So I'm really irritable. My husband wants to keep punching people like it's someone we drove by, you know, and it's just because we're so tired and overwhelmed and dealing with PTSD and whatever, but we have to continue to have the conversations across we'll call it across the aisle when it, that means the legacy market and the regulated market, <laughs> you know? So yeah, that's such a good idea. Yay for conversations uh -huh. that are recorded. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, we are so over time. And so I might just ask Jessica, if you would grace us with, the fi with your final thoughts, parting thoughts, and folks will absolutely have the opportunity to get in touch with the panelists and keep the conversation going. So Jessica. Yeah, I love all of the fire in the belly right now on this last point. Um, and, and I would love to really see that same fire uh, continue to move forward as, um, you know, Vermont progresses in their marketplace. Uh, I will say that, um, again, support your local um, 
businesses, your local cannabis businesses, your minority cannabis businesses, uh, look for ways to make your imprint on the industry uh, as well in, in whatever capacity that is and, and follow your passion um, in, in terms of, again, bringing your skill set to, uh, to this industry uh, that is uh, still growing, pun intended. Uh, and we need all of the support that everybody uh, is going to bring to it. So thank you for having me. Thank you. And thanks to all of our panelists and to the audience. Thank you. Yeah. Professor Varadi. The floor is yours. Now it feels like a hello, quasi captive audience. Um, I um, see what people were talking about, about having difficulty fitting a laptop up here. So that is phenomenal. I, I don't have any great profundity uh, to deliver. Uh, for those who missed it earlier, my name is Ben Barati. I teach cannabis law here at VLGS. I um, was previously a cannabis lawyer and licensed medical cannabis producer. And this weekend has been amazing, right? I mean, we've heard from just this host of really accomplished and dedicated world-changing leaders who are, who are working hard every day uh, to make the state licensed cannabis industry one that is economically efficient, but also compassionate, right? And, and, and maintaining this awareness of this long and racist and classist history of US cannabis regulation and the real need to do better. Um, but I have notes here because given the number of students in attendance, I think there's an important warning we need to be aware of. It's not my own. This is found in the Vermont Law School, uh, Law and Graduate School Student Handbook, which summarizes its cannabis policy on page 134. Cannabis, this document warns, has a host of potential negative effects. It can give you dry mouth. It can increase your appetite. You shouldn't drive a car or, it points out, go to class while high, which I agree. Um, and it says you should not study while stoned. I agree with that, too. But the part... I want to draw your attention to is at the end. It says, for long-term users of the drug, our student handbook warns, for long-term users, there's a bigger risk. For long-term users of cannabis, the drug can become the center of your lives. That's right, be cautious, because if you interact too heavily with this herb, it could take over your life. You could become a cannabis law professor, <laughs> a cannabis law regulator. You could become an advocate for social equity. So just be careful with the thing, all right? Um, and, you know, it's fun to think about, but it also it illustrates the tension of this moment, right? Where we find ourselves with this institutional awareness uh, that's embracing the idea that we have this rising industry that's full of interesting questions of environmental and criminal and immigration and social equity and corporate law, but also that it's a no good, terrible vice and everybody should stay away from it, right? And, and one of the great privileges of legal academia, I think, is that we get to spend a lot more time thinking about the lex ferenda, right? The law as it could be or what it might become. And what I've loved about this weekend is that when we talk about cannabis law, we're talking about an area where the lex lata, the law as it is, and the lex ferenda are, there's this moment of permeability where we really do have an opportunity and folks are working presently every day to figure out what's best for our society and really trying to put those principles into action in the moment, working together to figure this stuff out. Um, and there's another data point about habitual cannabis use that somehow the authors of the student handbook missed, which is that um, it, it leads to increased kindness and empathy. And many of our current legal and regulatory and industry schemes are actually working towards those goals in a way that we really haven't seen in other emerging industries, right? Mindful of these needs for restorative justice um, and for correcting some of the harms. Uh, the need for restorative justice as to that harm caused by our country itself, right? And entering into this practice area means that you have this opportunity to think about the law and culture that you see in the world and then the great privilege of moving to implement that vision on a daily basis, right? All, all law and regulation is uh, to some extent iterative, but that cycle is moving so much faster in this space as our legal and business uh, communities are working to implement those best practices and realize these sort of uh, utopian visions. So 
As we move on from our conversations this weekend, presumably most of us moving on to Babe's Bar at 2 p.m., 221 Main Street in Bethel. Uh, do think about all of that as you consider a cannabis law practice or scholarship or how these areas inter interact with other specialties. And, and think also about what it means for industries outside of vice regulation, right? If we can get it right here, if we can start to say, this is how we build a, an industry that is both profitable and compassionate, that's building opportunity for new market operators and also not leaving behind our craft producers and those from historically disadvantaged communities. Yeah, maybe that's a template with broader applicability, right, beyond the cannabis space. And so this question that lawmakers and uh, business leaders and activists tend to act, ask themselves in this space is rarely, you know, how can I as an individual best capitalize on this new opportunity in this cannabis space? We're starting to ask what kind of world do I want to live in? And I really strongly encourage you to ask yourselves that question every day, whether as a cannabis lawyer or as a human, and to work towards the answer that feels right to you. Uh, we are at the tail end of prohibition, and, and this is the moment right here and now where we have this unique opportunity to build a, that foundation, as, as our VLGS motto puts it, for the people and the world. That's our motto, right? For the community and the world? Community. For the community. Yeah and the world. Um, with that, uh, thank you so much, really, to all of our speakers who graciously generated, donated. Look at that. I have not gotten a lot of sleep this weekend. Thank you so much to everybody for coming, for our speakers who donated their time and insight. Uh, a particular thanks to our amazing students at the uh, Food and Agriculture Law Society who worked so hard to coordinate this event. Um, Thanks also uh, to the Latinx, American, and Caribbean Law Student Association, the Black Law Students Association, Native American Law Students Association, and the Center for Agriculture and Food Systems, who all made uh, incredible contributions of time and energy, and I think, as to caps, money. Um, Thanks also to our sponsors, the Tea House, Efficiency Vermont, Nikan, and Vermont Compost Company, and Ardent. Is there still time to buy raffle tickets? Yeah, there's still time to buy raffle tickets. Uh, and, and those folks have donated some fantastic prizes. Um, and thank you also to the students who volunteered here over the last couple of days, making sure everybody knew where to go when wrangling speakers and apparently protecting us from an attempted incursion by a high school mock trial team. So uh, yeah, well done. Um, Bill Bond and Brian, who are working on a Saturday. Thank you, gentlemen, very much. Um, and and our, our Dauntless catering staff who are doing that, building in grounds and cleaning professionals who have worked and will continue to work to make this comfortable and a kind of space. Um, I, I want to personally acknowledge um, VLGS students Sam Ellis, Alyssa Shea, and Fallon Ryan, who um, together with the Falls Board and the student body have just worked absolute magic in turning an abstract concept into an event uh, that really, I think, perfectly illustrated both the state of the present law and, and what it could with our collective efforts become. So thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's pretty much it. I uh, look forward to working with all of you on making the law as it could be into a present reality and to seeing many of you this afternoon at Babes. Thank you much. Big thanks to Professor Verratti.